Yeah. Ah, yeah. Sorry. And um, so we'll go through that. So I'm going to start with the gear, and then I'll tell you um, how to make up your own rig. So that's a lot cheaper way of doing it rather than buy the rigs of us because it takes us a long time to make them. Um, but you can buy them us if you want. It's up to you guys. Um, and then um, we're going to go out and teach you how to do it and how the gear works and how to understand um, like your GPS drifting. Is on the same <laughs> do. Okay, so um, yeah, so welcome on tonight. My name is Doug Burt. Um, Stewie's downstairs. There's about ten of us work here. We'll, we, of the staff that work here, probably um, four of us have uh, deep drop, maybe five. Um, yeah, more than a lot more than one. So uh, I've been doing it for twenty years, um, maybe more. Um, my wife's Japanese, so I was one of the first guys to bring me uh, Epoch into Australia back in two thousand. I think it was or nineteen ninety nine. Um, which is the big reels, which I'll show you later. And and we always used to game fish, obviously, out there. And we see the bottom is quite aggressive out here. There was a few commercial guys drop lining out here as well, back in the day. And then we decided to do some dropping and we started catching blue eyes and cod and bass croakers and everything. And it's still to this day as, as good. But the beauty of these days is, especially the last year, um, is the advent of, um, oh, there's actually different, different ones, but it's the, SIM chart you get uh, to put into your GPS. So you've got um, CMAT Reveal, and I think there's a, another one, just Bruno use, I can't think of the name, sorry. Has anyone got that yet at all, CMAT Reveal? So if you haven't got it, I'd suggest you get it for your GPS. Um, if not, um, you, if you look at Navionics, you'll forget it for your phone. If you've got Navionics on your phone, is anyone not? The same as the Garmin one? Uh, very similar, mate, yeah, very similar. Yeah, does anyone here not have Navionics or Garmin on their phone? Yeah, if you don't have it, I suggest you get it. Um, it's about, I think Navionics app's about like 40 bucks a year. Navionics boating. Just have a look underneath your um, app search and it will be your Bible. And really good when you have your mates boats because you can flog their marks. So, <laughs> very good. I always do a phone search before you come to my boat. So. <laughs> but uh, it's a really good thing. And um, it's the clarity in that and the bottom, it has the complete same stuff as your $400 or $300 chart. But it's on your phone for 40 bucks a year. So it's cheap. It's an investment like you would believe in. And before that came out, um, we had a lot of marks which we've accumulated over 20 years. And, and between those marks, we, we've had looks around when we've been trolling and that. But, we didn't know how much bottom is out there till that to see that reveal come out because we used to see that. Um, it is just uh, off the off the it's just off the planet. So every time we go out now, we make a point. We go to a new mark first or last. So we're always testing new little dark spots on the on the reveal because what it does, we'll show you a bit later on, on the chart on the thing here, but it allows you to plan your your trip ahead. So this is before we do all this. <laughs> Uh, plenty of trip ahead where you can go to, you know exactly how far out it is, you know um, exactly the contours, what you're fishing, and you'll see the dark patches. And if you run just contours on your GPS, you, you don't see the shading, of course, it's a normal GPS, right? You've got the contour lines, they're all squiggly, whatever, and they might be a bit tight. Um, and there'll be other ones where there's big gaps with not, I think, no, gradient might drop 20 metres in a K, you know, or, or half a K. Um, but as I said, when we've got the CMAP reveal, we're going, holy shit, look, there's a big hole there, there's a big hole there, and they're in between our marks. And the first time we ever got it, which was the last, well, about a year at least now, um, we went straight to the first spot to try, and lo and behold, in between our marks, which we never knew existed, was a 30 metre drop, and we just smashed the cod and flames and everything else in there. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how good it works. It's, so it doesn't show it on your, on your typical um, charts, okay? But it does show it on CMAT Reveal. So get into it, guys. But the first thing that they help you out. And if you don't have marks, um, as I said, we learn all our new marks from 
from those charts. I'll see that reveal. Or whichever it is. I'm not sure. What's it called? The Garmin, right? Do you know? Relief shading. Relief shading, correct, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So relief shading. So I think they all share nearly. The whole lot of them sort of combined, yeah. Garmin wants $300 for the card. Yes. And then you have it on your phone at all times. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So the Garmin one... I think Garmin and Pruno, you can actually download onto, uh, share, the, and it's Bluetooth through, through your yeah, sound, right? Yeah, yeah phone, that's right. Phone, yeah, phone. that's right. I need to check your phone out later, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and then the um, the the um, Navionics app is um, standalone, separate to your GPS, as far as I know. But it's only forty bucks a year. But it becomes your GPS while you're out there. So you compare the two that you're looking at that chart and look at that chart. And if you aren't running, see that reveal for three hundred bucks, whoever it is. Um, you can just use the GPS on your iPad or on your iPhone or whatever. So anyway, we'll get to that later. Okay, um, gear. So for many years, um, before electrics um, and still after electrics, we only had one electric for a long time. So we used to wind deck, LV deck winches. Some of you may already still do that. Um, has anyone used the LV deck winch in 400 metres yet? Take turns. It's too hard to go <laughs> one go all the way up. You just can't do it. Even the, even the Reef King, which is a big one, the 18 inch, you might get you try and get a hundred turns, and then your mate takes over for hundred turns, and it's slow. Um, but it's it's still productive. It's just hard work. Um, has anyone used like a fifty W or something like that out there yet? Like something like um, I put it in my other room, but like a Tiagra fifty wide or eighty wide. Has anyone tried that out in deep water yet? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> very hard. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've done that too. Very, very, very difficult. And uh, I've actually jigged with a thirty wide. Uh, out there in, on gyms in about 550 metres and hard work. So, um, but in the advent of that, which we're not going to talk about tonight, we may do one another separate seminar on jigging out in the deep water, but the little reels these days and the PE line so thin, you can actually go a lot lighter and it's, and it's actually quite fast and easy until you hook the fish up. Um, but electrics are the way to go, so that is the alternative. Obviously, we're talking. Up to 200 metres, you can, you can line fish easy. 220 metres, it's a little bit of hard work, but you can still do it. Um, over that, you have to really go electric, so otherwise it's just too hard. Hence, we're talking about tonight. Can I get a show of hands how many guys have got electrics in here? Yep, so most of you have, that's good. Okay, so um, in the electrics, um, it, for what we're doing, the base model I'd start at would be like a Tanacom 750 up to 300 metres, which is a little diver. It plays 4,000. Shimano up to 300 metres, but when you get out to 500 metres, you need to go up to a, a Force Master or a Beast Master, which is this style here. So that's a, um, that's a Force Master, I think. Yes, it is. So that's a Force Master there. Um, they hold about 1,000 metres of 80 pound and about um, 750, 800 of 100 pound. Um, we're finding that 80 pound is suffice out there. I've never broken off on a big cod or anything yet. Um, and it's very hard to break on the bottom and you get hooked up. So 80 <laughs> seems to be enough. <laughs> get 100 on, sometimes you've you know, got to put it in a cleat to break it off. It's really hard. So that's the thing. But when you're out chasing um, those big, like uh, bass groper, the bigger fish, which is like 70 kilos, my biggest is 75 um, in a bass groper, you need to really maybe it's 80 would do it, but 100 would be a lot more comfortable and, and safe, if that makes sense. Um, most of the time you fish in that, that sort of fish if in that sort of 350 to 500 metre mark, 550 maybe. So even 800 or 700 metres is, is enough. Um, as I was saying to Glenn, the gentleman who, um, earlier tonight, um, the beauty about electric reels is they don't really care about how much weight, you, that, like we care about how much weight we want to wind up, it's hard work, right? <laughs> With electric reels, they don't, they don't know. So you just throw them more weight. So if you're fishing, um, if you've got 700 metres of line on your reel and you're fishing in 600, just put a bigger weight on so it's more vertical. You don't have to keep letting it out with a lighter synchron. And the fish out there, they don't give a crap either about, about weight. They're not like snappering close where you've got a float line and use small sinkers. Out there, it's get to the bottom and you're, you're using like a Patanoster style and the, the arms of the, of the, the branches um, I just loose and you're generally using circle hooks and that needs to be, the more weight that's on there, the better it works. And the more in touch with the bottom you are, the better it works. So unfortunately you lose sinkers though, but the, the bottom is very aggressive, very volcanic, I think, or something. It's good for sinker sails. Um, 
So the Force Master, that's our biggest selling reel, and the Beast Master is about, it's about 500 bucks dearer. Um, the difference in the Beast Master and the Force Master is the, the Beast Master has a brushless motor. I've never seen a Force Master uh, heat up or stop like some of the diatanicoms do do that. Um, the Mega Twins aren't too bad in the dialer, but they're, they're actually dearer than that though, you know. Um, so um, that's what I use. I've got one of each, okay? And I find them both very similar to use. Um, but that's up to you guys what you want to get. Uh, the rods you want to use, um, generally as a rule, we sell three lots. Three rods are very popular for us to sell. One is the tag and deep drop rod, which has been out in Australia for two months. Uh, they are due back in uh, next, on the 7th of July, we'll have 20 coming. Um, and the next one is the, is the Shimano status rod in the P5 to 8 swivel tip. It also is a very similar action. And this is the Pen Ocean Assassin in the deep drop. It has a really good tip on this one. And the action of those other two rods is very similar to this. So it's quite tippy, but quite soft on the tip. So, but it's still able to pull up two 30 kilo cods or whatever at the same time. Okay. Um, the beauty of our fishing out there is that the, <laughs> so many, like, has anyone had like a, a full on day out there, just smashed it? Anyone done that yeah. yet? Yeah. Done that. At, on Sunday, did you? Yeah. Well done, mate. Did you get cod or? We've got seven bar cod. Yep. Right Are you off Brisbane way? Yeah, we're just off uh, yeah. one of your marks. We went yeah. to the Barclays North of Brisbane. Okay, good. Okay. That's yeah, good, mate. Yeah, good. <laughs> There's a few more marks down. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it is just like the best fishing ever. And the best thing is the fish are the best eating fish. Like you think Pearl Perch is good, wait till you try a flamey or a, you know, a good piece of bar cod or blue eye or something. And if you eat blue eye in a restaurant, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, so get back to the combos. Um, that rod there, yeah. So a combo like that, I think we've got a special at the moment for around about twenty three ninety, I think it is. And that one there is around about. Quote, I could be wrong, but I think it's around six. Uh, no, eighteen hundred. Anyway, Stewie got the price them downstairs, and we've gone a little bit cheaper online, so it's a bit cheaper online. But the real line's really good uh, that we're using as well, and. The latest advent in, in what you guys need to learn about electric reels is um, power, power to the reels. So that's their main um, problem with electric reels is if they're not getting direct power or good power source, um, that they're obviously not going to perform, right? So um, our suggestion has always been to have these Mincota plugs. They seem to be the best. They've got electric outboards, you know what I mean? Um, so Mincota plugs are... Um, Male, female plug, they're stainless steel, they don't corrode up, they're not like an Anderson plug. When I have my 680 Hanes, I used to run Anderson plugs in it. I replace them every six months, so they're up under the combing, and they still crapped out all the time, you know. So I suggest not using Anderson plugs, I'd be using the Encoder plugs. Um, their power's like 100% direct, so that's really good. About 100 bucks a plug or something. The female plug sits up under your combing or somewhere out of the, out of the weather. And the male one um, goes onto your power lead, okay? And that's sort of, um, you try and place it one either side of the boat, or, or if you've got the luxury of putting four in, then run, uh, like your rods come up beyond that angle, you can run two out of one side of the boat, and you can run two out of that side of the boat, or you can just run one each on either side. Um, and to wide up to the main source, they do draw battery. Now, we have, um, a couple of times in a, a Grady, my mate's a Grady 33. Um, we've flattened the batteries nearly twice, I think. And they're good batteries too. Uh, because we're running, I thought we were running off the house batteries, but he was running off the starter batteries. And, um, but then it ended up draining everything. But we had three rods going. And, um, and we had a hardcore fishing day. It was down in Tweed Canyons. Deep water, hard work. And um, anyhow, the, we first lost the sounder. The sounder blacked out. Then we lost the radio, and then we shit ourselves because the motors don't go, we've got no way to contact them, and out there the phone doesn't work, and no one else around. Um, and, was, and there's a storm coming up, so <laughs> it's all, all everything was against us, but uh, we managed to um, get the, we couldn't get the lines up, we had to cut the batteries off because we didn't want to use the battery to wind up the lines, so we just cut the lines at the surface. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and then just cut the motors, get it to recharge the batteries. Um, but... Now, 
there's this little thing. So I've been testing this out for two or three trips now, two trips for 12 hours a day. When we go out, we do a big day. So we'll leave at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, we'll be at our spot at 6.30, 7 o'clock maybe at the latest. Uh, it's about a two hour run where we go, two and a half hours. At, uh, it's about 70 k's from the seaways where we like to fish. Um, and we fish until, until nearly dark. So we're leaving to come back and it's just the sun setting. And I'll do probably 20 drops in a day. So the average drop is about 20 minutes period. Like even in 200 meters deep, it just takes that long. Um, and this thing is a lithium battery, so obviously it's in a waterproof case. They are about 400 bucks, 398 or something like that, guys. Um, but they just run all day. And um, I'll get through to show you downstairs later, a normal battery versus this. It, it's like supercharging your, your uh, motor of your car. <laughs> Amazing the speed difference. So when we, when we spill up a reel, um, it's about half the time to wind up, to spill up the reel. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And all day, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Just plug straight into your, to your thing here, and uh, away you go. And the strap's to your rod, so it's not in the way, it's under your rod, and you're fishing on the top of it, and it's on there all day. That little battery just cranks it. I normally take out like a big badass battery on my mate's boat, crunk. <laughs> Had to carry it down to, the, down to his house or whatever. Um, but that's it, yeah, so an alternative. But, you know, lithium batteries are expensive as it is, so I think it's not too bad a value. I've got, got 12 months warranty, but any battery's got 12 months anyway, so... Yeah, but that's what's new on the market is that little apparatus there. There used to be ones that you can get in for divers that could screw into the, to the fitting, um, but they're, they're small and they don't last as long as that. The most powerful. I think that's 10,000. 10,000 something or other. I'll show you that instead, isn't it, later anyway. And that comes with a plug that goes straight into that reel. Just plug straight into it. It'll fit um, Force Masters, Beast Masters. Um, there is this little fitting here, which is in my pocket. It's like you reminded me, Gary. Will it fit a Z9? Uh, sorry? Will it fit a Z9? Uh, no. So they're bringing out a bigger one. You need one more size up, mate. Um, that's, I've got a uh, 9SP over there. It's my other rod, a third one. <laughs> and uh, that's my original one. Actually, I've had that for 20 years, I think. Um, and, um, it's, uh, it needs to have about twice the size to get the capacity to drive the motor, and that's a lot bigger motor. Um, and um, the fitting that, which I'm trying to find my pocket is somewhere, the fitting is um, a different fitting. So, uh, I haven't got it here, but what it is, it's like a little yellow connector. I've got one downstairs. And you cut off the connection on, on the, the, uh, uh, the lead, on that and then put on this little yellow connection and the little yellow connection goes on to um, the, your power lead that you have on there now, existing power lead, that goes into your reel. You cut the other end of that so and join the two together like that. And it's, um, that's like, uh, it's, all, it's all fully marine proof, if that makes sense. <coughs> yeah, but I'll need to show you downstairs. I don't know about that yet, man, because they haven't got it out yet. So I'm guessing what the I asked the guy today to tell me, give me some guidance on it. It's pretty pretty plain chain. <laughs> um, but that one there has been really good. Yeah. So but the mirrors charging, okay. charging, yeah, so it comes with a charger, um, about oh. about seven hours. So with all lithium batteries, like my suggestion is don't charge it overnight. You should never do that with lithium apparently. You charge it because they can explode or something other. <laughs> Any lithium that is. Um, safe things to do it. They always say lithium batteries charge on concrete and charge it during the day when you got when you you know, round it. Yep. So at work or whatever, seven hours. Um, I leave mine overnight at home. <laughs> Up to you guys. Um, but they're a good thing, and amazing power. Of course. Okay. Um, so eighty pound, hundred pound braid. That's the rods. That's the reels. And then uh, we're going to go to the rigs and then how to make up your own rig. So. With the rigs, um, we use, when I'm fishing for pearlies, I'm only using like an 8.0 circle, I'll pass this around. Um, this little rig here, um, I finally found skirts that glow blue. So glow blue is like the, the best colour for attracting fish. It seems to be um, next level. Then glow green, we found. Um, like pearlies and, and even flamies, they just can't resist this type of thing. Um, this rig is 130 pound um, branch, a 130 pound main, 
and it's UV line, which is the same as um, Jason uses on Leader Systems Australia, these type of rigs here. I'll pass this around as well. These are really good as well. So we did a thing the other night here, but I can turn the lights out and we did the blue torches, a disaster. You might have saw that on, on YouTube, but um, tonight I'll show you how it works properly. But so the, both these are using UV um, leader. So UV leader um, to the fish is different to how we see it. Um, and supposedly it makes them want to eat it. I think the smell of bait would be better, but that's, I'll pass this around. So the one in the big packets, the one we use on the pearlies, and you could use the other one too. The thing with the, um, the one in the big packet that we use on the pearlies, um, I have caught bar cod on it up to about 20 or 30 kilos, but they're gonna be hooked in the mouth properly, but it's just that little bit light that if they do take it down the throat, I know I've lost some good fish on it, it's, it's chafed the leader. Um, when you chase some bar cod, you really got to go maybe to 200 pound to bit for safety, okay? When you go chasing bass groper, you got to go to 300 pounds. 300 main, 200 branch is enough, okay? Um, and these bigger ones are in that, that, uh, that area. So these other ones, I'll pass around. As, as we go deeper, we'll get bigger. So these fellows here, um, I'm using those out to about 250 metres. Uh, as I said, did you get bar I've caught bar cod probably up to about 35, 40 kilos in that depth. Um, but generally we're running um, similar, similar weight and not lost many, a couple. Um, but got most fish. Uh, when you go up to 13 which is the next size up, um, most of these come with some sort of glow on them like so. Right, and this one that Jace is just uses pure UV, so you, no glow on there at all, but the UV and the UV light that um, makes the whole thing very vibrant under the water. So I'll pass that around as well. So without the light, Doug, is that, it won't do anything without the light? Without the UV light, you, uh, I think the fish will still see the UV leader maybe. Uh, but it activated better with the blue light. So <coughs> when I'm fishing that pearly rig, um, I'm using um, a blue light. Of, there's a many different blue lights available, but anything like those blue lights there um, to make it stand out better. But I think that I think anything that's glow will make it UV anyhow. Anything that's um, in the area, whether it be a glow squid or a, or a light that's um, putting out glow, like a brightness, it'll make the UV work. But a UV light, you know, UV torch is different to a normal torch, so you put a normal torch on a UV line, it does nothing. Put a UV torch and then it just glows up, so I think UV light's probably better, yeah. Um, so that, that size there, we're using out to about 350 metres, maybe 400. Um, and that 400 is where your bass, or 350, I caught probably the shells, I caught a bass groper, but generally 400 plus. Um, had it been the other day, mate, when you got yours, mate? 360. Yeah, 360, yeah, that's right. So they seem to start at 350, I don't know why. Um, I have heard of them caught in around 280, but it's quite rare. So the bass grope is like a, a bar caught on steroids sort of thing. Um, and that's when we go into the big, the big mothers. So we're going up to like uh, 15 o hooks or 14 o hooks and um, 300 pound branch or 200 pound branch. If people ask me, do you put three hooks on or six hooks on? Now Jason does do a six hook rig. You want the one going around there, maybe. Um, personally, I only run three hooks because I don't know if my reel would pull up six if you've got six cod. And, and out there, because when you find, especially new grounds um, or grounds that haven't been fished since last year, when you first hit them again, um, it, you will get six fish on. It hit the bottom, it's just like instant. It is, they all just jump on. When you get one on, so the secret of catching bar cod especially, and if you don't know, you've got to learn to not straight away. You get, like when you're, I don't know if you, you some of these guys obviously is allergic to what I'm talking about. You're sitting there, you're watching it, right? And you'll see the tip, and it'll be, it'll bite, right? Do you mind to hold that, Gary, just for a sec, buddy? Just not my time. So you'll see the tip, and it'll bite, like that, and then it'll load up, because there's circle hooks, right? So you know you've got one fish on there, and then most, most of us will go, tunk, because you want to push that button and get the thing up, you know? 
but the secret is with, with barcode in particular uh, that we've learned is they tend to throw their guts up. When they throw their guts up, all their mates come over to feed. Then they jump on your line. Then it, you get the second one on. <laughs> and then if you can just hold a little bit longer, um, you will get that third fish. Okay? And if you've got six hooks on, I have no doubt you'll probably get six fish on. But I don't know how you're going to get them up. But <laughs> yeah. Does anyone here use six hooks out of the deep water? You do, mate? How do you go, mate? Uh, not here, down south. Oh, okay. Um, and did you get a full string sometimes? Yep. How did the reels go? Uh, they, yeah, they, they get it up eventually. They, they fight each other, and the beauty of cod are, especially um, uh, bass groper and, and bar cod, is that they, I'll leave it here, right? <laughs> is that, um, we get rid of the catches if you don't mind. <laughs> the best thing is um, that once they get to about 80 metres from the top, it seems to be the magic depth. Um, generally, they'll just they'll shoot to the top, they blow their guts out, they blow their eyes out, they get the bends or whatever. And um, they just kind of shoot into the top and the reels, these things, are, all these reels, they think, I don't know how they think, but they speed up automatically. So if there's, oops, well done. <laughs> so what happens is um, the line will be going, ring, 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 like that, and then, then all of a sudden it just goes, ring, and when that happens, you look at the back and you'll see this thing go, just about like those submarines coming to the surface, you know? And um, they kind of fly into the surface and there's a big lot of bubble, uh, bubbles and, and they're on the surface and it's going to wind to the boat. So when they do that though, sometimes they fall off. And that point there, you should, if it, you think you might have got two fish on or one fish, think, oh, that's a good one. But always look back. And if you see a belly floating, that's your second one that's just fallen off somewhere on the way up or whatever it is. So always keep an eye on deep water fishing for another one floating past. And quite often you've got like three or four boats out there. We're always looking for someone's fish tail dropped off and just gap it in the boat. <laughs> so <laughs> and you get a free fish, you know. And so it does happen, I've done it many times, many, many times, not more than, lots more than once or twice. Um, don't know who they were, doesn't matter. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the hook rigs. I, um, I'll just quickly jump to a couple other hook rigs you can buy as well. So Black Magic do a good range um, that they do the um, groper grabber. So I've, there's, only, there's only two hook rig, but I've put two together. So I'll run four. And I just loop the loop to loops on the bottom. I loop them together and make it four. Um, and that's, they work really well as well. I'll just pass one of those around too. Thank you. So all this stuff, guys, is about 30% of the pricing uh, for you guys. And um, for pearlies, there's this little rig here, which is an instinct rig. I don't know if you guys have got one of these in your bag, maybe not. But these are cheap. It's like 10 bucks. Um, but they work really well on pearlies too. Any of those sort of dress hooks, the cod and that love it. Flamies love it, everything loves it. Um, you can buy, if you make up your own rigs, um, LCAT do a range of circle type hooks and they're quite a good hook as well and strong. Um, and you can buy a packet of six and make up your own rigs as well, dressed hooks. I'll pass that around as well. Thank you. So guys, when it gets down the end there, just chuck it on the floor and get it later. It's all good. Um, yeah, I can't make that away. Um, and then you can get branches to add on. So you can... Um, which will go through a bit later on when you make up your rigs. But you put a three-way swivel on and you hook the... Um, if you've got like a 1.0 or 2.0 that's big enough in the eye, you can hook on this, these shark clips straight onto your swivel or you run two um, crimps with a little bit of line in the crimp. I'll show you a bit later to do it. Um, keep them about that far apart and quite a big crimp as well. And you just hook the, the, um, the, clip, the shark clip in between the two crimps. So it can't slide down, it can't slide up. And it's, you just clip them on, clip it on, clip it on, clip it on. I'd probably stop at four maybe. But up to you guys. I'll pass that around too, mate. Thanks. Um, I'll just, we'll show you the big reel while we're still talking on the tackle side of things. So, um, oops. That's right. Yeah. Now these things are heavy, so, <laughs> and tall. So this is the big one that I use. I used to use for a long time before, before. see, for many years, um, they used to get the Tenacon 1000, which was the old diver one, but the old ones had no nuts, so they were just terrible. New one's a bit better, much better than the old one. Um, and I used to use an old Tenacon 1000, which I bought in Japan as well, many, back in the 90s, something. Um, and then 
Um, there was nothing bigger than that, that was it. And it wasn't until recently when the Mega Twin came out and the Beastmaster of Force Master that we finally had a reel that was able to do nearly what this thing does, but not quite as powerful. Um, but at the same time, hold the capacity of 1,000 metres of 80. So the other ones only held 600 or 500, so they weren't big enough. Um, and you couldn't do much with them. So this big fella, I only use when I fish now over sort of 400 metres, I don't use it. I take it out of it most times, but I don't use it unless I'm fishing over 400 metres. Um, and, I, and I still tend to use my Beastmaster and Forcemaster um, up to 600 metres, and this one rarely comes out out of, the, out of its shell. If I get done on that one, I might use it, but that's about it. It's like a bloody winch. So you'll know, mate, you've got nine same size. Yeah, I think all mine yeah. yeah, did you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 good, yeah. So on the rods, um, I used to use, this is a proper one as well, with the swivel tip, I used to use a 130 pound chair rod um, because it's long and sat at the back of the deck. The trouble a lot of boats is these days is that as you know, they've sort of gone back the other way now, but for a long time, the transom was too much of a slope and the motors are out there and you've got a, like a pod on the back and your rods had to be like seven foot long to get past the motors when, you, when you're doing this type of fishing. So that's why we used to use chair rods because they're seven foot long. They, they just clear the motors at the back. Um, as I'll teach you a bit later on, you're backing down a lot. So if your rod's too short, um, you're going to run over your line continuously. You've got to be really careful of that. Um, so yeah. But this is the, the beast. This has actually got that clip on style I was telling about where you can clip on the swivels. Um, but yeah. So I don't use the chair rod anymore. I, I then went from a chair rod to when I bought my Hanes, because uh, I had a shorter back on it. Thanks, mate. To a, um, a 37 kilo T curve stand up, Brent Butt. Um, that was a good rod, too, if you know that one's a very popular game rod. Um, it's about maybe 5 foot 10 tall overall long butt on it, and, uh, but the problem with both my chair rod and my 80 pound T-curve was um, when you get, because you've got the swivel tip, it pulls the rod tip around and it bends your butt. So my butt, um, which is this part here, on those both those rods was actually skier whiffed off to the side like that, so my rod was facing sort of not the right straight angle. It was actually bent the butt over time. I don't catch too many big fish, so. Um, I went, then once you get a swivel tip, it eliminates a lot of that. It still pulls the rod around, but the tip follows the line. So these things here actually move with the, with the, um, the, the way the line goes, okay? That's the idea of a swivel tip. So the other thing I recommend, especially if you're going to use those bigger reels, and we sell those bigger reels, the millions, um, we've got one down, I think, is that you need to um, make sure your rod holder is, is a one or 80 pound or 130 pound rod holder. Um, I've been out in guys' boats, so I put that on and it's ripped the rod holder straight out of the boat, which is pretty scary when it's a $300,000 boat. <laughs> and the rod's loose and then I'm like, holy crap. Because um, there's a lot of strain. Like, you know, I just don't have, like this little reel here, it's just crazy. If you hook on a 30 kilo cod, plus you've got four kilos of weight, and you just try and try and wind it, try and, like, you know, it's so hard. This is like, I don't know how that little reel can do that, but it does it. It's amazing. Good thing. Anyhow, um, so that's it. So any questions on the rigs at all? Pre-made. Okay, we'll go now to the sinkers. So, um, general rule, I find, is, um, like, uh, Sort of 100 metres is like um, maximum of a kilo. So maximum, generally speaking. So 200 metres, two kilos. 300 metres, three kilos max, not starts, max. 400 metres, four kilos. Okay, people ask me about lead and steel. And we've done, we do lots of things. We're always, always trying to learn and trying to understand um, the difference, why he's getting more bites and I'm not getting the bites or vice versa. And a lot of time, if you use steel sinkers, that's the problem, okay? Steel sinkers are cheaper and easier. I'm talking Rio bar and everything. Um, the problem is that, that it's all rocked in. It hits the bottom, it pings, and, and the guy over that side of the boat will get the fish with a lead sinker, but the guy with the steel will get not as many, okay? So my suggestion is if you're going to use Rio bar or whatever, and I'll use it too sometimes, um, is you've got to heat shrink it or you've got to wrap it in, in a duct tape or something. Okay. 
Stainless steel, I, it doesn't ping as bad as steel as you know. Um, I think it would be okay, but expensive. <laughs> I don't know if you've got access to it, mate. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Stainless steel's heavier, isn't it, as well, I think, than normal steel. Yeah, so um, I definitely would be giving that a go if you had access to it, mate, yeah. But lead is by far the best. It's not the most healthiest for the environment. I don't know what it does down the bottom, but it just disappears in the mud. A lot of the areas are fishing in mud, too. So you bring it up, it's got mud all over it, it's got shelves stuck to it. Because obviously going down, at the speed it goes down, it hits pretty hard on the bottom with a big bang. Or a big about, boof. What about when you pour your lead in a can of Red Bull? <laughs> well, you could do that, mate. Uh, that would probably work. Um, that's what I do. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, okay, so I just don't know if the, if the top would be strong enough, though. Is the top so strong enough? cut the top out of it. Do you? So you cut the top Put out it, drill a hole through it? Or? And then just pour the lead in and just get a bit of chain. And just oh, okay, right, drop it in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Totally yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> There's, like... We've improvised heaps of times. A lot of times we've gone out there with not enough sinkers and we've had a big day and lost as many things as we caught fish and had to improvise and we've had like 10 one pound sinkers on or or whatever we can find the boat and, you know, and dropped it down. Christ, the other day someone brought out 30 fucking bricks. Do they? Bricks? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about bricks. You want something to get down there quick. It's all about getting down there quick and not getting too much bow in your line. So oh, these guys have even got like speed tapered ends on them so they shoot faster you know um but bricks will probably get, get down there but you're gonna have a bit of waving on the way down i think yeah but whatever works it works Let's get it down there as quick as you can though so what are the weights of those ones you got there uh one two three and four kilo yeah i like four kilo then that's the maximum of 40 minutes but i'd definitely i use that size out in when we went at thousand meters that's all you're using i've never had to use over four kilos um there are days when i've been out there and the line's been like, um, so that's the boat. Sorry for the guys in that corner there. But that's the back of the boat there, in front of the boat there. And you drop your line out and it'll go out in that sort of fashion, all right? And it feels like it's going that way. You'll back up on the line, back up to here, and think it's going to be straight down. And it'll, it'll look like it's straight down. You know you're in 600 metres or 500 metres on the sound of it. You've got 800 metres of line out. And you're going, how the hell can that happen? I've got four kilos of lead on. But even four kilos of lead on, you still get that effect with a, with a really strong big current or wherever it might be. Um, and that's why this waterways out here is so protected. The, air, the reef fishing we're doing is because it's just really hard to fish between November and April because the tides is too strong. So any over three knots is really hard to fish. And I'll teach you how to do that. I, we'll teach you how to do it, and there's an art to it. Um, but that, when it has that mid-current stuff, you just can't get away from it. Those days we just pack up and go home, or go in closer, or try and find it, something different. But, or put a big, big, bigger sinker on, but you shouldn't have to. Um, so that's just sinkers. Any questions on the sinkers, guys? There should be one question. How much line do you run under your leader? So, under your rig. So, there's a, I don't run any less than 80 pound, and if I do run 80, I generally double it up. I'm trying to get my sinker back. They're expensive bastards, so I want to get it back. <laughs> so I know my rig's strong. Yeah, Jason's rig's only from 45 pounds. Sorry, mate? Jason's rig from the whole I bought the whole 40 pound. Yeah, oh, that's, 40 that's, that's too, so we'll too have, light. We lost four or five two kilo sinkers because of it, and then we got 100 pounds smart on it. Sorry, Jason, I you got shares in that company, mate. <laughs> 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 mate, it's too light. You want to use 80 or I use 100, generally speaking. Yeah, that's what we use. Yeah. Uh, I find yeah. a few people there. Yeah. Don't worry about the 45. Nah, 40 is too yeah, light, mate. Up to the bottom, yeah, yeah, that's right. So you try and back up on it. Yeah, that's right. So you back up on it, back up on it, and you just try and pop it off. Yeah, just like your normal when you're bottom fishing. Um, so 100 pound, and I run long enough so that my sinker is um, like when I get the gaff that last cod in the boat, my sinker's still below the boat, so it's not smack on the side of the boat because they're heavy and it's awkward, and you. It's like if, if you can fish with gloves because you're not really feeling the bites through your fingers. So have gloves on is a good thing and you can actually just grab that leader and pull the sinker up. So it's quite heavy to pull a four kilo sinker out of, into the boat. How long was that again here? Uh, around about uh, 1.5 metres. Oh. Yeah, below the thing or two metres maybe. Um, and I believe like the line's up a bit off the bottom as well. So that's always a good thing. The strange part when you're fishing out there is the, the fish generally is sitting like 10 to 30 metres off the bottom. 
but they seem to like your bait on the bottom. So you can lift your line and drift through all those fish and get jack crap. It just, I rarely get a fish that way. Um, but you drop back down the bottom, they must just swim down, down to it all the time. You'll learn about that too. Um, so any questions on the sinkers at all? Okay, good. The sinker, that's, that's what I'm saying. So if I run my line 1.5 metres up, I rarely get hooked up on the rig. Yeah, um, yeah it generally breaks off somewhere down there if it's sharp. Yeah. Lights, okay. Um, I think all lights work. Um, I think the UV lights definitely work better if you've got UV line. Um, I think you really need it. Um, green ones um, work really well. Some people say green ones attract green eye sharks. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but when you get green eye sharks, I think anything attracts them. Um, so if I say squid attracts green eye sharks, I don't know. Um, I know there's lots of them out there. So do you know what about green eye sharks? What they are? So they, has anyone eaten green eye sharks here? They're not too bad, you know. Seriously, <laughs> tell your mates that you take it with you. They're really good, but <laughs> and you take the cod. But um, no, they are really good. They're actually not too bad. If you, t if you who likes flake? You guys, no Victorians here, okay. Um, <laughs> it's not too bad, right? But green eye sharks are not a strong tasting sh uh, shark taste. They're actually really nice. The flesh is very white, and as white as that light nearly, you know, it's very white. Um, they, they don't grow over about 1.2 metres. Um, and anywhere between about 250 and 450 metres, there are trillions of them off the Gold Coast here. There are trillions of them all over the world. It's the most prolific shark in the world. Okay, so people saying that sharks are decimating, that's bullshit. There's so many of them. <laughs> so, and other sharks too, but yeah, that's right. Uh, and every one you catch, whether it be that big or that big, it's got about five live babies in it. They just must just have a good time every night. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of babies. Um, but they are really good to eat. The only rule I can't get out of the fisheries yet, and if you're listening, please clarify this. They're not classed as a shark, they're classed as a dogfish. So, because they have a bone, they have a spike on them. They have a spike on their dorsal fin and a spike down the back, last little fin before the tail. Those spikes are very, I've been impaled twice and they go in deep and they're jagged. And what they do is you can, you've got to grab them on the gills, right? From behind the head on the gills, but they can still reach around and impale, impale you with their spike. They're very good at it. They can do like a wrap around like a snake around your arm. Yeah, it's amazing, eh? And uh, so you have to be really quick with them. So grab them on the gills, get that hook out, and put them in the ski or throw them back to the side. Um, and then you've got to pull the other two or three off your line because you get them three at a time. Okay? The thing I can't on last the fisheries is I class as a dogfish, there's no bag limit. Class as a shark, I think it's one or two per person, I think it is. Anyone knows what the shark rule is. Um, and obviously they're under 1.5 metres, so they fit the category. Um, which is a terrible category, but anyhow. Um, so, I don't know how many keep, so I'd like to know what the truth is in that one, but sometimes when you're not catching much, they're better than nothing, okay? Those real bad days. Yeah, we, actually we've, we've dropped shark down and caught cod on shark. And those, those, cod, uh, those um, sharks, sometimes they won't be on a reef, and the next time you go out there, they'll just be ever on the reef. And when I... Um, Phil and I always, always check their guts, what's in their guts, they're normally chock a block besides the babies. And when I check their gut, I've, um, they must like, decimate the reef. They, they're like piranhas, they're like locusts on the fields, you know. So I've opened them up and I've had, and they've got like cookie cutter sized pieces of cod in their gut, right? And some of the um, skin, I look at the thickness of the skin on the cod, some of the skin's quite thick, which is obviously a big cod, and some of it's very thin, which is a small cod. So they're just going hard on everything. So this must come in like a pack of things. So if you ever sink to the bottom, you'll probably get done by a green eye shark, but about a hundred of them, like piranhas. So they're the piranha of the deep. But anyhow, they're, they're painful. So go to the colon, please. Um, okay, next thing, wind on leaders. So on all of these rigs, we use a wind on leader. If you're good at doing um, an FG knot or whatever you want to do, um, go for it. But I prefer to use a wind on leader because it winds through the guys nicely. Um, I generally use around 150 pound when I'm fishing sort of up to 400 metres and over that I'll use a two or 300 pound <coughs> when I'm fishing like 500 metres deep. Pull those Why big bass uh, Just because it's, 
allows, even though you're not hand, you know, you are handling it a little bit actually by hand, but um, it just gives you some guidance as to when your line's coming up. Okay, so you, even though you've got zeroed out, so these things here will stop on zero, so like an elevator, they come hooking up and then they, the last sort of six metres they go, they slow down and just come in progressively slower than six metres, which is the length of my wind on metre. And then I always set mine at a metre from the tip um, and then I reset it the second drop because the first drop, your line gets a bit loose and, and when you come on the second drop, it's on tighter and actually comes up short and by the time you see so second drop, you're, you're trying to rip your stat swivel through your tippy. So you need to reset the zero again, the second drop from the last fishing trip. So reset it. So what I'm saying is so you zero, zero yourself out and, it, and it'll be at 400 metres and it comes up fast and then the last six metres it slows down on most reels and then um, it stop, it'll stop mine, it'll stop one metre from the surface. My snap's there, my fish are just there, you know. So, um, but when I got the cod on, I've asked the question before, um, I like to wind it by hand. So I'll stop it and just wind it by hand because as I said, the hooks fall out and I'll, I'll hand line it in. So if you've got to wind on lead, it's just easy to grab, either grab the braid. It also acts as a shock as well. Even though these tips are light, some are, some are not, like the, that white rod there is very stiff. Um, and the, it acts as a shock because you've only got braid, you've got 400 metres of braid out and six metres of mono, if you've got no six metres of mono, it's quite aggressive on the fish. And particularly um, blue eye cod, blue eye cod fight right to the top. They're like a mangrove jack, they go hard all the way to the top. Even though the eyes are hanging out their head, they still keep going hard. And if uh, anyone caught blue eye cod here before? Yeah, you know what I mean. They fight right to the top. So, um, yeah, it just, it just, you can manhandle them in easier. Six metre in length is, is enough. From what we got told, it's hard to break through the reef because that's one less thing to go wrong. Right? Yeah, it never goes wrong. No, like we, we oh, I mean, but if we put a wind on, on yep. if you don't tie it up properly, that's one more thing that could go wrong. Okay, so that's what we're here for to teach you how to do that. Huh? We'll teach you how to do it so it doesn't go wrong, okay? <laughs> so you just got to do like a cat's port that at the top end, we can teach you how to do it. Just do it like a little bimini twist. So, you, like, I always have spare ones in my bag. Um, so, if I do get wrapped around the prop or something stupid like that happens and I get chopped off, um, I just quickly do a little bimini twist about that long. And when you undo a wind on leader, don't ever undo the, that first. You just leave it like that all together. And just with the loop of it, you just pull it through. They show you on the back end how to do it. I'll pass this around. Um, and then on the other end, you should always have, if you're deep dropping, you should always have a pair of uh, crimping pliers and crimps with you. Because it, it's very hard to tie a knot 300 pound line, unless you're pretty good. <laughs> uh, so, you need to have a pair of crimping pliers on the boat. And most of you have probably got that for rigging up for little blacks and stuff. Um, you can buy a cheap pair for like, I don't know, around 30 bucks or 29 bucks. Okay. Um, suggestion, do that as well. And have just a pack of crimps on board. And just crimp it up, which we can teach you how to do maybe, so it doesn't happen again, and away you go. Um, so, any questions on that at all? So that's the whole rig pre-purchase type one you can buy, you don't have to do anything up yourself. Do you guys want to learn how to make your own rigs? I would suggest you do it. Um, the reason why rigs are so expensive is because they take us like 20 minutes to make one, and if you, or half an hour, so it's just man time. Um, but you guys can spend half an hour, have a couple of sherbets, and uh, get into it and, and have a rigging day, you know? When those days blowing 30 knots and peeing down rain, go set up a heap of rigs. Because some days you don't lose any rigs, other days you lose five, which means five sinkers, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so how do you do that? You just get the gear. So you have got some of the gear in your bags there tonight to set, start you up on rigging up, but you need a bit more. Um, so hooks, obviously. Um, is there any hooks in there at all, guys? There is some tenos. No hooks? No, no. no, okay, sorry guys. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so with hooks guys, if you're going to fish um, for your pearlies, everything's got to be circle. Don't use any J hooks unless you chase the swords maybe or something like that. That's another seminar though, but, um, but you want to run about a 9-0 or 10-0 um, or 8-0 minimum.
to the Tenno Circle. Okay, these things are cheap as, they're like 13 bucks for 25 and they work well. I'll pass those around. So you get 30% off of the stuff too, as I said earlier. Um, they're really good. And you make the rigs up with that, I think you got 130 or 150 pound litre. Um, that's what we use out to about 200 metres deep, as I say, saying, 250 metres. And, and um, you space your rigs no closer than a metre apart, okay? So our golden rule when making our rigs up is a metre apart between 500 mil branches, okay? You want that, that rig, to, thanks a lot, thanks mate. You want that uh, rig to be quite supple on the side of a quite a tight main line. And that's how you get all the fish, that's how you hook them up better. Um, so the rig is, you've got, we've got all those rigs in your bag, we've made those up, it took us hours. <laughs> but yeah, that's all good. Um, but uh, if you copy that rig, that's how you do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that rig we class that as sort of uh, medium light size. I think that is 130. Close Sorry, Gary. Cheers, man. I think it's 130 all the way through. So that one I'd use. Um, Pearl is at the lot at the heavy end. Um, and flame snapper and bar cod to 30 kilos. Uh, oh, sorry, at the at the lightest size for that type of fish. Thanks, mate. Yeah. So, um, and that gives you some idea. They're little blue lumo beads, which are really hard to find. We haven't any more left, or not many left, unfortunately. But, and we can't get them again. <laughs> Otherwise, these green beads are fine. Okay, you can buy green beads in bulk like that. Um, you can buy skirts like that. They work at about two bucks a skirt. To give you some idea. Like something like that we sell for about, in that size, about your price around 25 bucks uh, or 28 bucks. And to make it up, you'd probably make it up for about around eight bucks or maybe 10 max. So it's a lot cheaper. You just got to put the time into it. And we've got all the stuff here. The only thing um, is in the swivel side to make that three-way swivel, you can't use your normal three-way swivels that you um, buy like the cross line swivels, with like, like brass barrel swivel with the brass barrel that side, they get snapped, they'll break. So they've got to be crane snap, which is like this style here. Um, these are they're about a buck each with your discount, a bit over that. That's probably the dearest part of the thing actually. Um, yeah, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so the, the main swivel is the, is the inline ones, top and bottom. Always run the swivel that's going to have the lead off it hanging to the top, not the bottom. Yeah, let's so yeah, go to... The, uh, the side swivel running off, off the top. Yeah, so yep. it's running off... It sits on the barrel. It sits on the barrel, that's correct. Yeah, if you have it the other way, it's only sitting on the ring yeah. and it can maybe pull that ring out, yeah. but it's very hard to pull the barrel out, yeah. Yep, yeah, so uh, always face it up. I hope that's the right way they did on your, on your rigs. Although <laughs> if not, complain to Stuart. <laughs> um, so tube, guys, you've got tube there, you've got everything in your bag there to, to get it going, except the hooks. Um, so metre apart, uh, when I'm chasing um, the bigger cod, like I'm chasing bass gropers or blue, uh, or blue eye, um, those fish are averaging 1.5 metres each. Or one point up to 1.5, but 1.2 is probably the average size, or yeah, around that. Um, so I suggest maybe running 1.5 meters. So your rig's like five meters long. Okay, if you've got say four hooks or three hooks, it's quite long. So you don't want to slap each other in the head on the line. So keep it um, keep it apart, and they can sort of fight it in their own area. And it does sometimes make it a lot easier on this too when they're a bit longer. If they're all short together it gets quite, I think it doesn't work very good. So keep them further apart, deeper water, further apart. Um, any questions on that at all, guys? There's another good hook, um, the Shintos, these are really strong. Um, they come in from seven O's to 10 O's. It's a 10 O, which that hook there, I'd use that on anything up to about probably a 50 kilo fish at least. They're very strong, maybe 80 kilo fish. You gotta remember, um, People say, oh, you know, you know, you can bend that hook and you can actually with an electric reel because when you're winding by hand, say, a 100 kilo mile or whatever, you only got your drag set like 8 kilo 
or 10 kilo maximum, or 12 kilo if you're using 37 kilo. And you can only put that much pressure on, so you're pumping and winding, and it's like, you think it's hard, but it's actually not that hard on the fish. When you're using these things, you're running like 30 kilos of drag or 40 kilos of drag, and those bigger reels have got 60 kilos of drag or 70 kilos of drag. It's like hardcore. It's like, you know, you could nearly pull a truck out of the bog type stuff. So um, it's quite easy to bend a hook if it's a big fish. So you got to understand the potential of the power of those reels. So um, you can't use a light gauge hook too light. The one that I passed around before, the Instinct hook, the cheap one, it's fine for um, a fish up to about 20, 30 kilos, but that would be the max. It'll just bend out, okay? Um, any questions on that at all, guys? Leader-wise, don't get stuff that's too springy. Get stuff that's sort of supple. So this is, um, in the, when I'm talking about 200 to 300 pound. So you want stuff that's sort of not, once you get to 200 pound, a lot of lines like that, that's as max, as, that's a hard stiff line actually, that one. But, that's as, as, as um, coily as I'd want it. Okay. Although the sinker stretches it out, but, but you just don't want it to tangle up because it gets tangled up. Um, I know that's important, that part as well. Um, when you get to the other tools of the trade, I said crimping flies and crimps. Um, knives, okay, you need a big badass knife for these fish. Um, you want at least eight inch, if not 10 or 12. If you fill in a cod that's that deep, it's not really going to cut the grade. It, it will, but it's hard work. So um, I use a 12 inch, I got 12 and 10 inch. Uh, big, uh, I think they're Rapala knives, like a Valley Barber knife. <laughs> so um, you need a big badass knife, okay? Um, bait, okay. We're about to go fishing in a minute, but the bait, preparation. Um, mullet fillets, probably the number one bait to use outside of 120 metres. It's really funny, I know how many of you guys use out the front here, use mullet fillets under 100 metres, but it doesn't work the best. You get little shit squire pecking at it and leaves the skin on your hooks all the time, okay? But if you put, and put pillies on, you'll catch good fish, right? You go out over 120 metres, put pillies on, you don't catch jack crab. You get a few, but not much. Um, there is a reason why I use pillies, I'll show you in a moment. But you put mullet fillets on, that is their stable diet, but I've never seen a mullet. <laughs> over 20 metres deep um, but that's what they love they love it and the other fish that is really good too is um, tuna fillets are really good um, as I said I called them green eye shark before but um, tuna um, even uh, fillets of a good slimy like those bigger slimies in summer freeze them up fillet them whatever salt them down uh, they're really good as well but your cut bait needs to be the size of two fingers that's the secret that's the size of your bait that's it so you see guys put massive big baits on, don't do that guys, you don't need to. So just keep it small. So out of a mullet fillet, which is um, that sort of size there, what I do is I cut it that thickness, one, two, three, four, and then the last one I split down the middle and I get six baits out of a fillet normally. And I'll normally take at least six, uh, 12 fillets, six packets of fillets out. And that'll get a sort of round, I don't know, 20, 30 drops, okay? Um, what I do though, when I use those circle hooks, even those little ninos, um, I always take out pillies as well. I use the head part mainly. So I cut the head, the, cut it in half, and I put that straight through the eye of the pilchard, okay? Um, and then I put on the piece of mullet fillet, just one stick through it, maybe two, but don't bunch it up too much on your circle hook. You want your hook to be fairly exposed. Okay, so they hang the mullet fillet down a little bit and the pilchers hang down as well. When they bite it, they mulch that pilchers up, which I was saying before when they, when they spew their guts up, and it sort of dissipates and the mates come in. It's really important. It's like a burly trial. Um, I have tried burly cages hanging off my snap at the top there. So um, it's really funny. I, I use an orange wire mesh one with about six or eight pilchers in it and a bit of tuna on whatever. And I don't think it makes any difference. But every time I pull it up, I keep thinking it's a spanner crab. <laughs> I don't know why. It's a, it's a weird thing in my head. But, um, but definitely, um, you can get burly cages, but I wouldn't suggest you don't need to do that. Just use pilchard. Pilchard on, then, then mullet fillet. Um, and that's the size, okay? Is that on all the hooks or just one? Uh, on each hook. Yeah. I do, oh, sorry, I do use squid. I did do 
uh, change it a little bit. So I find that although you get supposedly more blue eyes, uh, green eyes sharks, and I probably would vouch for that because I think they seem to love this squid, you know. So California squid's always the best squid to use in the box, but it didn't bring it up because it's too big. Um, but when you've got a squid, just cut it into half. You want fairly generous portions. Again, think about that size. Okay, so if you want to put just squid on your hook, do that. But I would, I would not do one hook without mullet fill on it because it is the best. And the guys that fish out there. Right the Sorry, mate. I find squid works good on the oh, it does. It does. And we'll, I will dress it with squid. As I was saying, I put squid in, mullet fill it on, I pilch it, and mullet fill it. But I always use mullet fill it. And it definitely works. I find flame is best. Um, does anyone not use mullet fill out there yet? Yeah, I squid. Squid, here, mate? Yeah, try mullet fill it, mate. Yeah. I know you probably do it right. Sorry, mate. We use liveys. Uh, liveys. Okay, so I, I, I've used liveys before. Um, the only problem is the speed going down. They do fall off sometimes, mate. Oh yeah. Yeah. Real quick. Oh dear, you have to. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they get ripped off the hooks yeah. on the way down. And if you think, oh, I didn't get a bite, you might as they're all empty, but they've fallen off. So, yeah, if you can do that, mate, it's probably not, you, you bridle them up to you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. We but they're good, they're good. Three mullet and one live And live yep. caught, I think, five or the seven fish. Yeah, 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 yep. Did you bring a live up survived at all? No. No, I don't think so, no. no. They get squ head squashed. But, yeah, um, definitely it works, so, okay. Yakas are good too. Yakas are very hardy, but you've got to, you've got to sort of bridle them up with like you, when you're using a live bait for marlin with a bit of a dacron and just loop it over the hook and pull it back through again. Yeah, and hang it off the hook. You're hanging yours off the hook, mate? Yeah. Yeah. You have to do it that way, otherwise they just fall off. Or else they yeah. spin around. And they you spin around too, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, but you know, um, I prefer to be at, but this time of the year, as I said, everyone, if you get liveys, if you can't get the liveys that where you're fishing, don't worry about getting liveys because that's the prime time to be fishing, you know, because you have to travel distance and you don't want to be sitting out there, wait for the sun to come up when you should be fishing out there at that point in time. Okay, any questions on the baits at all, guys? No? Okay, next, the GPS marks, so then how to do it. Okay, um, let's find my glasses here. Send me my glasses to find my glasses. There they are. So, guys, um, Please keep, I know you're just going to go out to your mates, but <laughs> try and keep, keep the marks to yourself if you can. Um, uh, you probably heard the story before, but a um, good mate of mine, Russell, um, he told me about flamies many years ago, showed me photos, but he goes to Cairns every year, fishes the marlin season on the boat he drives. And I know they get a lot of flames snap up, up in Cairns. And I always, when he used to show me photos, I always thought it was from his Cairns trip. And he said, no, get him out the front here and go, no bullshit. Anyhow. Um, after many years, he finally gave me a mark roughly where they were, which was in about probably 10 k's. And we just went looking and looking and looking. And our rigs were always like, because we've obviously been catching uh, bass groper and blue eye and, and bar cod forever. Never caught flame snapper though. And we used to use big hooks. So like there's a 15 over here somewhere, but, or 14 over it. Quite, quite big hooks, right? That, that at least 14 or 15 o size. It is very hard to catch a flame snapper on that hook. We didn't know that though. So we just use our normal rigs and drop them down the deep. And then um, one year, um, when we had these good uh, bar cod spots, and one year we went out, uh, maybe after five years of trying to find these flame snapper in the area, and we um, had been fishing for pearlies and had a pearly rig on. And I dropped down, and there's a couple of different times this has happened, one way is the opposite way, but this way, this particular day, it dropped down and I saw the bites on my rods and then I sort of load up and really load it up. I thought, holy shit, this is good, good fish. And then it just went off like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then it loaded up again and it went off again. And then I wound it up and all of my pearly uh, branches had, had gone. Right. And then uh, we dropped down again. And uh, I put that a bigger rig and a bar cod. So a bar cod that were doing me. I thought, like, shit. So anyhow, yeah, we catch them bar cod again. It was maybe the second time or third time in that same area. Same deal again. I had my pearly rig on, and but we're only using like 80 pound leader. Okay, it's light. And I dropped it down. It was on my rig, so I dropped it down. Remembering what happened last time, and I uh, dropped it down and loaded it up. And it wasn't as big this time. And I thought, oh okay. 
So I'll just check what it is. Because we get Snapper there too. We get Snapper and King is at the 280 metres. I don't think you guys know that. And anyhow, we wound it up and, um, and lo and behold, it was a flame snapper and it was on that little hook. And we're going, holy shit, this is a, like the Holy Grail. And we're like high-fiving each other. And this is about probably 2000 and maybe 14, I think, or 15, 14 maybe, seven, eight years ago. Anyhow, so then um, we then re-rigged. So we re-rigged up to 130 pound and used small hooks and then we just flame snapper heaven. And we realise that's what the secret is. You've got to have small hooks. And if you want to catch, there's a thing called ornate jobfish, ornate snapper. They are out there like the green one sharks. There's heaps of them. Has anyone caught those yet? They're really good eating, actually. Really good eating. Um, they only grow small there, but they're chunky. They're like a little rosy jobfish, maybe 40 centimetres max, or 45 kilo size max. Um, but they are the nicest eating fish. They really white meat. And um, so now we're rigging up for those. Unfortunately, you do get bark cod and they do ya. Um, but we're using smaller baits and dropping down and you catch them. We do use six hooks on those again, six at a time, five at a time. Drop down, the rod just goes and they're all between that sort of 240 and 3, 330 mark. Okay? So we're gonna catch it. And I think the, I don't know if there's a bag on those. I'm not sure, I need to check. Not sure, but check if you guys check before you go smash them, because you can smash them. So anyhow, so the flame is we're using heavier line, which is like the 130 pound rig that you guys have got, and that'll catch flames all day long. What's your yeah. hook? Uh, and around 80s to 10 o max, but 80s are really good, mate. Eights and nines. Where before we used to use we were using 13 and 15 o's, they're too big. Yeah. Flame is always there. We didn't know that. We've been fishing them for five years and didn't know they were there. And we see these big shows on the sounder, so. When you see flamies on the sounder, and they're like the holy grail for a lot of people, they were for me. Um, but uh, one. so if that's your sounder, that's not very good. Five, you're allowed done. Five, is it, mate? In all night snapper. Yeah. Okay, thank oh, you. No, that's for flame snapper. Oh, flame snapper's five. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's quite easy to bag out on flamies when they're on the bite. You get them two or three at a time. And the biggest one we've caught so far is about a metre 30, around about 12 kilos. Um, the average size is around, um, with the little flame tail, maybe 80 centimetres, around that three to four kilo, five kilo. Um, and then the other days you get big ones, they're all six to eight kilos, and a metre 10, metre 20. Um, but that's just sounder there, it's a bit of a lopsided one. Um, and this is the bottom here, right, a little bit of a bottom comes up, like that. And the flamies are, a lot of times you, you, your bottom is just like, uh, you know, like say here, there might be a few fish there sort of thing. <coughs> and that's a little bit greeny in there. Um, but with flamies, it is a solid, a solid red, like that. For those of you who caught it, you know what I mean, it's normally solid. So there's just, I don't know how many of them in that school, but there's a lot. So that's how it sort of looks. And when you can find where that sort of comes down and touches the bottom down here, that's when you just really smash them. Or it eventually hits the bottom, okay? Has anyone had that experience yet at all? No, but you will. Um, so that's how it is. Which mark, <laughs> So... The marks. Put my glasses back on. Um, yeah. Okay, so we'll start in the shallow stuff. So, for those of you at home, sorry, you can't see, you probably understand this, but everyone here can. Um, but, um, oh yeah, I was going to show you like some longs. You need to understand this, guys. Just to give you some perspective to where you are in the world of um, Gold Coast deep water fishing. You, oh, everyone's got that, heavy on this boating, for those of you who haven't got it. Okay, this is our, our local area that we fish, okay? Point Lookout, Jump In Bar, Stratty, Seaway, Burley Heads, Tweed Heads, Brunswick's about here, and then you've got Byron down there. 
So we're in like this big bay here. I don't know if you guys know that. We're in a bay, okay? And hence why when it blows subtly, it sort of hits that further, it gets rougher out further, and not too bad in close. Some days it's bad in close, so. Um, and um, it's, it's how it sort of, how it works. And the 24 fathom sort of reef is along here like this. Your 36s are out here like this. Not, not, not like that, it's a bit closer. And your 50 fathoms is just out beyond both Tweed Point and Point Lookout Point. And then um, the bottom so far is looking like this. It's sort of shelving down quite slowly like that. Then once you get to 100 metres, it changes and goes like that. Okay. And it gets quite deep quite quick. So a lot of people think, oh, well, 40 k's out to 100 metres to just past the 50s. You know, if I want to get to 300 metres, it's going to be like another 40 k's. It's not. It's only like 15 k's to 400 metres. So, so it shells off really quick. So once you're, if you've ever been to 50 fathoms, from there out to, say, 300 metres deep is only uh, 12 k's or something. It's not far. 15 max. If you go straight out, that is. Um, if you go to Riviera Grounds or Jimmy's, it's about 18 k's. It's not much further than the 50 fathom reef. So you're talking 20 minutes, half hour on a good day to go out to the deep, beyond 50 fathoms. The, the hardest part is getting to 100 metre line, which is that part, it's forever. Then it goes like that. And then we have these little little sea mountains on the way down. That's terrible, it's These little bumps on the side, and then it'll slope down, there'll be another little bump. And there's <coughs> ridges. And um, I always thought, you know, if you look at some of those Navionics charts and, and the, the um, Garmin one, it looks like, like tractor marks on the bottom. But as far as I know, well, I know when we drift over, we get snagged up. So it's actually reef, those big wide things. I don't know what they are, what they're made from, but big grader back in the day, I guess. But um, yeah, it's, it's reef and the little bumps like this. And most of those bumps will rise up about 20 metres. There's a lot of canyons too, like canyons and ravines and old riverbeds that'll drop 20 or 30 metres and come back up again. There's heaps of that out there, which I'll show you a bit later on, on there. Um, so once you get to here, there's, it's quite good out to about 120, 130 metres. There's little, lots of wire weave that, in patches, okay? And that's where we get our pearlies. That's where you get the bigger pearlies. So, you really you get the odd big pearl in here, don't get me wrong, but when you get out to like 100 or 120 metres, the pearlies are consistently 50 centimetres or 60 centimetres. And it doesn't matter if you're fishing off lookout or down off tweed or it might be, that's the magic depth. That's sort of 90, 90 to 120 metres. So, um, what I wanted to show you before was latitude. So, Point lookout is roughly about 27, 20 south, okay? And jumping pin bar is about 27, 43. So every time we go to there, that number has jumped by 23, so that means it's jumped 23 nautical miles. So about, and there's 1.8 nautical miles to, 1.8 kilometres to a nautical mile, so, okay? So, um, that's how we've gone. 23 nautical miles south. The seaway is south 27.56. And Burley Heads is south 28.05, I think it is. Tweed Heads is 28, around about nearly 11, but 10 or so. And Brunswick is about um, south 28. I think it's roughly 28, no, roughly 28.30, I think, roughly speaking. I hope if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, so from there down to there is, uh, is um, what do you think? Well, it's, it's 110 nautical miles, but it's not 110 nautical miles. It's only 60, uh, 70, sorry, 70. <laughs> so that's how you get the minutes. I know it's a bit confusing, but that's how you get the minutes and seconds in your Latin long. So every time that changes from 27 to 28, you've gone 60 minutes, which is 60 nautical miles. It doesn't go 100, it clicks at 60. 
and then from there down to there's another 30. So actually, sorry, yeah. So that's 20. So that's 40 miles down to 2800, and that's another 30 miles down to Brunswick. So that's 70 miles from nautical miles, which is about 120 something k's, from Point Lookout to Brunswick as the crow flies. Does that all make sense? Big time, except for the tractor mark, right. which I'll talk about in a moment. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, northeast north or southeast, yeah, and that's because there's bay shape. That's what I'm getting at. It, it's, it's very barren in this area here until you get out a little further, or you go south, or you go north. So, on this these marks, what I'm saying is, so that first mark is 27.35. So, if you look there, that's I'll write this down here. That's point lookout. Sorry about my writing, guys. That's jumping pin. Seaway. Burley. Tweed. Tweed heads. And that's Brunswick heads. So, if you look at those marks, 2735, you're about, um, around about 15 miles south of Lookout, but you're about uh, nearly nearly 16 k's north of jumping pin okay uh, so that's where your uh, pearl is a really good good area half up south australia and uh, north australia is there any fish up there yet at all in that 120 mark very good sorry mate yeah years ago, yeah, years ago. you get fish big pearly so and you get bar cod there you get big nanny southern nana guy they're real big the red ones but they're good size um, and then the next mark, 27.38, we're down a little bit further south, um, but not much further south, we're still in this area. 27.44, we're pretty well straight out from Jumping Pin Bar, and um, we're a little tiny bit deeper, 46. 28.03, we're down near off Burley. Is that all making sense now, where you, where you are located? 28.09, we're down near Tweed Heads. You want to go south, that's where you go. And 27, 28, oh, that one's, that's a span in the works. Um, so that one there is actually a really good spot. What's that doing in there? That's actually flamey area, okay? But that should be in the next row down. For some reason, it got, it got up in that one there, jumped the queue. Um, so those first one, two, three, four, five marks are all in this sort of stuff here from near Tweed to halfway up North Strati. And in between there, there's a lot of other marks too. So my suggestion is if you want to go chase pearlies or small bar cod, and your boat's not too big, look at this Steve, um, is to sit in that 100 or 95 to 120 metres and you zigzag doing about a K and a half, 2K zag every time, or zig. And at the same time running <coughs> north or south, whichever you want to go, work it. Have your sound run about a 20 metre window, because sometimes the pearlies sit up 20 metres off the bottom. And when you see pearlies, they are, um, if that's a pinnacle there, they're, they're just like dots. And generally, that's actually not normally pinnacles, just a little little hump. Sorry. So for those of you guys over there, there'll just be little dots of like that. And there might be a bit of fuzz on there, which is the wire weed. So you all know what wire weed is? It looks like um, this stuff here. That's wire weed, exhibit A. <laughs> So it's like a spring, okay? That's why we, and that's what they love to hang out in, that stuff. And you'll feel it, you get snagged up, and you think, oh, I've snagged up. But then all of a sudden it just pulls through. And that's the why we, it's got caught up, but it sort of works its way up the spiral and comes out of it. Um, and that stuff is what holds all your pearlies. Really big pink fish as well, small bar cod, and nannies. So there's, it's all the way through here, guys. There's this why we there, but as I was saying before, you just zigzag, um, but if you say you get to start the jumping pin area, you just zigzag between 90 and 120 and just zigzag and just, or you troll in summer and try and find it in summer while you're trolling around. So when I'm trolling, I never look at the top or bait, I look for the bottom. That's just me. And I just keep working it and I'll mark something here and I'll mark something there, here, here. And then I'll go out and fish it next time I go out. Okay, but that's all the way down. 
some of our best pearlies we get up here and some of our other best pearls that get down sort of off Burley or a bit south of Burley, 2807, if it's on there or not, close to it. Um, we got some there two years ago, I've got a 74 to 72 centimetre on the one drop, which are seven kilo pearlies, they're like Fraser Island ones, you know, big ones, eh? yeah. Good on video too, <laughs> huge. Big pearlies, yeah, big pearlies, yeah. And even this year, um, up here, we've got them so far about 65, 68 now, we quite big pearlies and chunky. Um, fish near, but I fish the electrics doing that. And we do slow pitch jigging as well, but that's another seminar. Um, okay, so that's what my recommendations are to, to find new grounds and, and look at the cement reveal and try and find some shadowing or whatever in that area, okay, or contour. Um, the next one, under 350 metres. This is going to be where nearly all you guys are probably going to fish the most. That's where I fish the most because it's a little bit closer and um, or I want to chase flamies and I love eating flamies, so <laughs> that's where I go. Um, I've found flamies, this is, so this is now three, say three, 280 metres, say. 280 metres is the magic flamey depth, okay, and good bar cod. This seems to be the magic depth. Um, so 280 metres are out here now. And um, generally speaking, that's stormy on your longitude, about 153, 53 or 52, seems to be that depth, or 54 maybe. It depends where you are. Um, but that is all the way down here, and it seems to be a common area for a little bit of a rise or a little bit of um, a trench. And it doesn't matter if you're up here, off lookout, or down here at Tweed. Um, there's, especially down this area here, down Tweed and that area there, there's a lot of ground. In the middle part, as someone was saying earlier, um, it is really, really hard to find a lot of fish in this area here. This is between sort of burly and jumping pin. Has anyone got any good marks in that sort of 280 metres in that area? Welcome to share. No. <laughs> okay. I've put some down for you. So the 2828 is like the area for flamies, okay? Um, like guaranteed near the area. You just got to look around there, there's heaps of stuff. And as I'll show you in a moment on, on the cement reveal, um, it's very easy to find new ground and find little dark patches and go and check it out. Um, I'll catch my pearlies right down to 2735 or 38, 39 even, 39, um, which is still north of Jumping Pin. You're up around here somewhere, but that's at that bottom end of that area I was showing you. So from Lookout down to here and up Morton Way for the, for the guys up Morton Way. Anyone here from Brisbane? You, for you? Uh, okay. So you guys have got the best grounds. You've got better than us. So don't try to get to South Passage to get out to get to it. Um, most of your best fishing is going to be either um, off the Cape and up to sort of halfway to halfway to Bribie, say, but out in that depth, or um, Point Lookout up to about probably uh, out from um, is it Hutchies? Which is Hutchies is the one that's about third way up. So due east of there, which is about. Henderson's it? Sorry, Henderson's Rock here. Henderson's the green zone, right? Yeah, we used to get some big wahoo before it's green zone. <laughs> um, but that area there um, is, is the honey hole. And you've got some really good uh, old river beds and, and ravines in that sort of uh, 350, three, which maybe we were the other day, mate, I don't know, but in that area. But I didn't put anything in those marks there, but if you guys that are up that way want to leave me your number, I've got marks, don't worry about that and I fished up there, um, <laughs> I'll give you some, but I'll have to send it to you. Just give me your numbers on the way out. Just, put them, just give it to one of the, the staff there, which is probably going to be me. <laughs> That's Stewie's down there. Um, and I'll send it through to you during the week, weekend. But, um, yeah, so guys, so 28, those two 28 marks, the 31 and 35, that's your flaming marks, okay? The 38 down to um, 07, which is about before the flames start again, um, that's the barcod areas, okay? That, and some of those are like 48k straight out the front. We've got to go straight at the front. So 27, um, 47, oh, it's a bit north of Seaway, it's not much north of Seaway. 2002 is a sort of off Main Beach. Um, 
then you get down to about up early, and then down further south, I don't know if, I know Gary has. Sorry, Gary, I'm going to spot a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. <laughs> there is really, really good grounds down here. Some of my favourite fishing spots. And the distance to go to there to here is about nearly identical. Um, it's about 60 k's to start where you start fishing at and go further south. Um, it's in about 200 to 240 metres, 230 metres. Um, some people say it's the, the rumours I hear, but they would, how would they know? Because <laughs> no one's ever get, dived that depth. But they say it's the eastern face of Mount Warning, when it was a volcano, landed out in the ocean out there and made this big ridge. I don't know. There is a lot of sand around it though, so could be. Like some it's people. The same area Robert Brunsley used to be. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately there's a few guys know about it. And it's a really weird spot. Like, I go up here, I hardly see a, a little boat. They're always six, seven, eight metres. It's a 70k run from the seaway up to the top end of it. And when I get down here, I know it is close to the tweed, but I'll see guys out there in a 14 foot aluminium with twin electric reels fishing with a 40 horsepower in the back. I was like, wow, that's <laughs> a little bit different. It's, it's close to Tweed. It's close to Tweed, I guess. So it's only like probably 25, 30 k's for Tweed heads down. Um, so if you take your boat down the Tweed and go out, happy day, it's super close. And as you go further south down towards Brunswick, it only gets better. It gets better. And that ridge down there that we fish, and Gary knows, it's 20 k's long, Gary? 15 k's? It's just non stop, and there's fish all the way. And whether it be kingy, snapper, bar cod. I get flames out down south. Here's a couple of little bumps down here um, on the outside edge of it. I haven't caught much on there in flames. I don't know if you have, I haven't. No. But, but you get those, you, yeah, they're green eye sharks. <laughs> you get a lot of these, um, I don't know what they're called, yellow eye pink perch or something. Have anyone caught those at all yet? Yeah, they're really nice eating. They're about two to three kilos, like a mango jack, but they're pink and for the yellow on it, and they're really nice eating, the yellow eyes. Um, get a lot of those there. Get three different versions of it. I think one's a female, one's a male. Um, he's a king, and he's a snapper. Uh, I don't get many pearlies there, believe it or not. I, don't get, I haven't caught many pearlies over 140 metres deep. I don't know why that is, but they've got eyes on them that makes them think they'll be out in 600 metres deep. But um, they seem to stick in that 130 or closer. But yeah, so big ridge down there. Um, and that is on there. So those last, uh, that 28, sort of 15 is the high end of it, top end of it. And 28, 29 is getting very close down to Brunswick. So you've got some really good marks down there, guys. Look around those marks. You won't miss. I don't trust that you just won't miss. We were down there a couple of years ago and there was schools of snapper that were down 120 metres. Thick. And they would have been, like, yeah, like like maybe 50 metres thick and as far as you're driving in every yeah. direction was just... Yeah, you bag it real quick, oh. It was incredible. Yeah, I know. Like no, 50, 50, 50, 60 centimetre ones, yeah. when you filled them, the flesh mm. was really orange. Yeah. I don't know why that was. I think it's the cold water, I think. Like, yeah, so right. ones we catch up here in about 250 metres are similar too. Yeah, wow. Mm. Mm. So guys, um, those, just getting back up to that under 350 metres, that 42 to 02, is you're talking like inside of Riviera grounds, um, inside of Riviera, I uh, saw Riviera and, and Jim's Mountain in about 300 metres. That's that tractor mark I was telling you about on the GPS, on its shading. It looks like a big track. And that's really rough rubble. You lose a lot of sinkers there, unfortunately, but it's a real cod country and green eye country. Green eye's everywhere. It's part of the parcel. Um, that's the only, they're like pests, but you know. Um, okay, so any questions on that area at all? No. Has anyone fished down that, besides Gary, anyone else fished down that southern end? <coughs> Mate, if you get a chance, please go and do it. You need a New South Wales licence though, guys. Make sure you got it. Okay. Just go out to eat all the time, but never yeah. that far out. Never that far out. You don't, yeah. well, you don't normally have to, right? Yeah, <laughs> the fish traps yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, just a little bit, little bit beyond there. Yeah. But the beauty of down south, guys, is besides the only bad part is having the licence, but this is like from, from here to here, is that 40k run, right? Out to sort of 90 metres or 100 metres. And then out to say, um, say that's 500 metres, that's gyms, is another around 18k's. And in that 300 metre line, that tractor mark, it's about, uh, I think it's around uh, 
12 k's, roughly speaking, or 14 k's, so the max. Um, when you're down here, though, and you're in that sort of 230, 240-meter mark, 230, from there out to three, this mark here, 350 meters, is about 1.8 k. And then from there out to 500 meters, about 600 meters. It's really close. That's why you see tinnies out there 14 foot long. So Steve, when I take your boat down, that's the place to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wrong way to tow, but worth the drive. We get a lot of our customers tow their boats down in Brunswick and fish out in that sort of area in five metre boats all the time with electrics. Because it's close, 20 k's out max. You know, they did 20 k run, that's it. Yeah. But um, where, where if we up here, you get a long way, and you guys in Brisbane you get a long way out as well. You got to go out through the bay and get out another 20, 30 k's again. So it might be worth driving down that way. But the trouble is the bars, that's the problem. The bars are a bit shitty. So if you've got swell under 1.5 metres, that's fine. But if you've got uh, and current um, in a little boat, you wouldn't want more than a knot of current because you get pressure waves out of the sea. It gets a bit scary if you've got a southerly blown and, and a hard northerly current. And then the next lot, guys, is um, the deep waters are catching, like bass scrapers and blue eye and stuff like that. So um, the top mark is the canyons off lookout where you might have been the other day in that area mate yep yep it's the start of the run so some of these marks i've given you a start and end run on, on the mark so where you start your drift with in yeah it's, it's incredible on the, on the map there mate isn't it and then um the 44s uh and 44 45 that's all riviera grounds i'm oh, sorry that's all um, um jim's mountain and 49, 51, 50, 51, that's all Riviera grounds. So I'll show you what it looks like here on a minute and Saka's gonna do it for us, what it looks like on the screen. For those of you who haven't seen it, it looks like two big asteroids or three big asteroids are landed on the, in the mud <laughs> and they're about maybe two k's big and they come up about 100 metres. It's like a big boulder. It looks like Air's rock out there in the deep depth. Um, and then when we go further south, there's a big gap between, as I was saying, there's always a big gap between sort of here and here. But when you get down to 28, 15, um, we're in the Tweed Canyons, which I've got a picture of, I'll show you in a moment as well. So Tweed Canyons is like the most uh, aggressive bottom compared to anywhere else along our edgy between Brisbane and here sort of thing. Um, so Tweed Canyons are very undulating. Um, it'll be 500 metres, the next one just drops off to 800, 900 with maybe 400 metre, 500 metre area. This goes And then it might come back up to 600 in some areas and drop down to 1200. It's just out of control. But you just don't need to fish over five, 550. There's not much. There's fish there, I think, but I don't know what they are. Uh, something. <laughs> and if you want to catch a sword though, that's my recommendation there, or that first mark right at the top there. If you want to catch a swordfish, get up around that 20, uh, 2730 area. I'll have a go up there, look out. So, any questions on that at all, guys? We've got it all. So, you sort of found that 27, 28 area is sort of like plain snapper. But in that uh, 240, 280, 280 is a magic mark, mate. Right? Yeah. yeah, 280. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'm just going to show you um, how, what it looks like, and then I just got to do a quick video, I guess, for nine minutes. This one was out with my brother Paul last year. And you can just see we start pearly fishing. Zach, our day would normally be, guys, obviously not between the 15th and, and 16th or whatever it is of, in the closed season, but our day would normally be we'd stop eat on the way out and bag out on pearlies and get our pearly bag limit, big ones. And then we go and then chase cod or flamies from there. So um, this day with Paul, though, um, we wanted to find new grounds, so we went looking for new grounds using the shade, shade relief. And um, we <coughs> found new cod and new, new flame snapper mark areas in about two, 280 to 300 metres. Okay. And that time here as well? Um, close to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was around about that 27, 35 area, 38, right? Just north of Pin Bar. We started just north of Pin on the Pearlies and then went out further. Do you want me to turn the lights off then?
Oh, once you get it, once you get it ready, yeah. Do you want me to change the angle then? So I just want to stop that for a sec and I'll turn the lights off. So, mate, do you mind hit that switch there, buddy, if you don't mind? And I'll just turn this one here off too. So when you use that Navionics app, guys, you can record your day's tracks. Uh, was there a little switch here, don't you? I don't know. Sorry. Oh, wrong one. That's it. So you can see that okay? So you can see on this here, this is... um. In about, uh, this is actually that day, I think. So, can you see these little black marks here? Okay. On, on a sonar chart, they're not on there. They're just like, be flat. It'd be 280, and then all out there is 300. Nothing in between. But these little dips here where we're fishing this edge of are like 20 metre dips and 20 metre rises, but they're never on the charts before. Um, I don't know how they do this, but... Obviously, someone's done it, but I don't know how they can see the bottom. Um, but this has recorded our drift. Um, this, can I just go back to the start side for a sec? Go through this for a couple of minutes. Okay, so we've sounded up over it. So I've started the drift here, and you can see there's a bit of current. We're drifting at about two knots, two and a half knots. And that's our drift there. Obviously, enhanced speed. And it's a pretty straight run. Generally, you drift out there is northwest to southeast. It seems to be the common common thing. Go and make up for another drift. We've gone a little bit wider. So each drift we do, we try and suss it out a bit more. So you can see the edge of the darks there, and it's dropping off. So we fish on that edge of that of that um, hole we found. Go back up for another drift. I might go a bit wider again here. I think yeah, one more a bit wider again. And if you look at the minutes, you'll see each drift takes, well, it was 35 or 34, I think, at the start of the drift. We have probably one drop down in this. I'd say we've hooked a fish up there. So it was like a 16-minute drift. Okay, I'm going back up again. And this is just off my phone, so it records everything. So now we're doing a big, long drift. We might have got a good fish at the start, so I'd do a big longer drift. So the time's on the other side there, and that's our drift speed. So what I'm getting at, guys, is leave as many lines on your sound uh, GPS as you can, because they're your friends when you go next time fishing. Okay, you know exactly the drift you did last time. Obviously, you're going to put a lot more marks on there. So we've gone back up, and then we do one more drift here. We nick off. I'm not sure. I think we stopped here. So one hour and twenty-seven minutes, and we did one, two, three, four drifts. So the average time is like nearly uh, twenty minutes of drift. So roughly speaking, twenty-five minutes of drift, and you might get one drop in that twenty-five minutes if you've got fish on, especially. This takes that long to do. Um, We've since gone up to here, see that dark spot up there? Um, it's only, I think that was around about um, one mile away if that, two miles maybe. Um, and got cod there as well, double head cod actually. Um, I haven't tried, I haven't been out a bit further yet though. But that's like that tractor mark I'm telling you about. That's, it goes from sort of west of Riviera ground all the way up to north of, um, just north of um, Jim's Mountain. And if we go to the next picture, darling, sorry. Any questions on that? Okay, so this is the mountain. So thanks. that's Jim's Mountain there. That's Riviera Ground. See, I said like a big, like there's rock on the bottom. So that one there, you're talking a mile and a half, about three, two and a half k's big um, by about the similar width. Um, it's in about 500, 550 metres on this side. Um, it drops down to where it's sort of scathed out from the current, I guess, um, on around the front of it. And that's where the fish are sitting up in there. They're always sitting into the current, normally speaking, in front of the reef, okay? Um, and we start our drift up here, always in the shallow and drop over the edge. And then it comes back up again on this big hill. And it comes up from about 540 up to about 430, so about a 90 metre rise. It's quite a big rise. 
In the top 90 metres, that's like a 30 storey building, so that's pretty substantially high. Okay. And, um, and then uh, we drift down this side of it, we drift down that side, we drift down the top. You get tuna out here as well this time of year. Um, and then there's this one down here, this is bigger. This is Riviera ground, so Riviera is a bigger rock. Uh, it's a bit shallow on this side, it's about three, 380 or 350. It's about 480 on this side, and it's around about, uh, I think it comes up to about 420 on top, so it's about a 60 metre rise, maybe, 70 metre rise. Um, again, you'll see those spots are at the top here, into the current again, um, but there's always fish on the top too. And I get fish down the side here as well. Um, and this one out here, um, we didn't, no one really found that until a bit later. It's not much further out, it's only about a mile or two miles out further. That's in about uh, five, 540 metres, I think, or 560 metres. And also there's always loads of fish at the top here as well. Um, and there's scattered other stuff around. That's that track I'm telling you about, see that one there? It goes all the way up to here actually, and it starts just south of Riviera there, that's where it starts. And, there's, and if I zoom in on that, that I've got seriously 100 marks on, on here, that's just like zoomed out. So that's in feet. So it's 900 feet, which is about 300 or 280 metres sort of thing. All right. And this is um, around five, 540 metres. So that's the Navionics one, is it? That's the Navionics app, yeah, on release shading, which would be the same as Garmin and whatever else. So does that all make sense? Some really good grounds out here. When you see the next shot, it looks even better again. So this is out the front here. This is our desert area. So inside of that, between three, 280 metres, 300, and this is about sort of jumping pin around, around here somewhere. And this is the seaway is about here. So on that side of it, until you get into about 125 metres, I haven't found many marks yet. But they're there, but I just haven't had time to look for them. Probably should keep going to all the spots you know, plus try the new ones out here, and you get a bit sidetracked. Let's go to the next one, though. Thanks. Same, is it? Yeah. So this is Tweed Canyons. This is what I'm telling you about. It's just ridiculous. So I got a lot of marks down there too. You guys have got some of these marks there. And when I zoom in, I've got maybe 300 marks here. Every little ravine, <laughs> every little everything. Um, this is really good fishing up here, this area here, very raviney. Um, you can't fish out here, although we have tried. That's about 600 metres deep out here. Here's only about 380. Um, it's a good area of maybe 300, 340. Good bar cod and bass groper here um, in any of these little holes. It's like, so it's like old riverbeds, right? Like the old Grand Canyon sort of thing, so to speak. Um, and then this is where the big trench is what I was telling you about. So here it's, um, right here, it's, oh, if you can see a depth there, 800. So it's about 280 metres, which is the flamey sort of bar cod area. And then distance wise, of course, oh, there you go, there's 1.1 nautical miles. See how big that is? So from, from, 280 metres to 1,000 metres is a bit over a mile. So it just goes chunka. And you fish along that edge where those ravines are, but you get staying up because it's up and down. And each one of those ravines is dropping 40 metres and coming back up again. And then you're going through these gullies, you know, and that's where the fish are. Um, but if you get into this abyss here, you won't never reach the bottom there. <laughs> it's about well over a kilometre deep. Um, Can you tell us about the boat. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah. The line as you over the 100%. So, the first one I'll show you with the yellow one to sort of give you some perspective of how we drift. Then I'm going to show you on the board here how, how it's done, mate. Um, so, any questions on that at all, guys? You should get there and search, but use your, use your chart because it will help you a lot. Okay, that's it. I will quickly show the video just on how we do it. Then that might help you as well, mate. And I'll explain to you as, as it goes along. So just excuse the, if there's any swearing, I don't know. <laughs> We're a high five because a couple of new marks we'd never tried. We just went and found fish. If it's always a good thing when you find your own grounds and own fish. Do you find you get more flamies north or south? <sighs> Both. Um, I get um, down south, Windara south, lots. Yeah. I know they get them on 2808 to 2810, which is sort of a bit north of Tweed Heads. Um, the young Jack that used to fish with Roderick, 
and um, and um, oh, not not Roderick. Uh, he's finish with. Oh, I think he did with Roderick, but also with. Uh, that had the contender. contender yeah, 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 that's right. So he just he also dig, dig for flamies, and he used to get a lot of it twenty eight oh eight, but I haven't found them yet. Yeah. So between there, there's a big gap. Yeah, there's nothing. Well, there probably is, but I just haven't found them yet. Yeah. So you can always watch any of this stuff on our on our YouTube page, guys. Just go to Doug Burt's Fishing Channel. So this is on Paul's new Surtees. So it's, I'll show you how they bite as well. So cod are quite unusual in their bites. Sometimes they're, they're aggressive and they hit it and pull hard, but generally cods do that. They lift the rod up, but you'll see this in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you see okay there, guys? Yep. Oh, that was... When I'm... When I'm electric reel fishing for pearlers, I'm always jigging as well. Can't help myself. So 120 meters here. So if you like jigging, always jig while your um, while your electric reel's doing the work for you. It's like your mate. He's gonna push the button sometime. Let go of the reel for a sec to push the button. That's all. So when we're drifting, um, the line there, I can't, I can't see what the other is over there, sorry. So that's the Force Master, that one. So you can see the bite there just then, guys. So because you're using circle hooks, they generally self-hook. You don't need to set the hook or anything. And when you see that rod bouncing, as I said, it's up to you whether you want to push the button and get one up or you wait and get two. But if it loads up pretty big, I'd definitely pull it up because it could be a cod or something. When you're using your electric reels, don't put it on full speed, especially if pearl perch, so it pulls the hook out. You have a very soft mouth, and the mouth is big, and they've got those fins on the side, and they spin on the way up, and they, um, it, the hook just pulls out, so you can't uh, go too fast. So I think the high settings, it'll have high, but it's about 28 or something on most reels. Um, we generally pull up at about 18 to 22 on the setting, okay? The falls has got pearly there. I don't think we've got many real big ones that day. I've got a few. That doesn't look real big. <laughs> so I'm running the same rig as you guys have got there pretty well. They're using squid for bait and there might be uh, the pilly on that but not using mullet fiddles in that depth so I have a habit of doing that I because I don't want to pull the sinker up I just hook the hook onto the first guy but it's quite stiff and leave the sinker in the water so I'm see I'm just putting the pilly through the eye and then putting the squid on top of it the squid holds it in place that's what I'm fishing under under 200 meters. That is. So when the pearlies are on, you can bag out in one or two drifts. That's the problem with pearlies. I think Paul sabotaged me there. Oh, well, I wasn't looking. <laughs> Always make sure your rod's locked into the holder. Those, has anyone used those rod holders here with the push button adjustable ones? They're really good rod holders, eh? Wow. Oh, is it? Oh, is that his? Yeah, there you go. They're very good, Gary, eh? Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. Especially with deep one where you bring the rod in there. Yeah, 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 that's right. You can swing it around, yeah. So Paul's fishing his electric out the back there next to me in the same, we're all fishing the side on a bit of wind blowing, so. Um, sometimes, you, if you if you got that uh, scenario where, you, where drifting, reversing doesn't really do much for you, you better off all fish at the one side. But generally speaking, if you're running two electrics, um, 
I'd be reversing up and just keeping your motors always between the two lines. So I think we're running about a kilo of lead there, or two kilos maybe, but one kilo. So um, you don't need to thumb the line at all. When you get to four kilos though, you have to be careful. The Beastmaster has a um, like an anti-backlash system on it. So you hear like the motor cut in, it puts a braking system on it, so it doesn't overrun. The Force Master, I don't know if my Force Master has that feature or not. Not sure. So you just sit there and watch the tip and keep letting the line out. So when you go to side on, you can't back up. So you just got to keep dropping that line out, dropping that line out. Uh, but once you get some too much of an angle, it's no good. And as you all know that with any fishing that when it gets that little bit of slack, that's when they bite. And that's why we're like reversing up. It's a bit better pearlies. Pearlies are very easy to fall off too, guys. They, they wiggle and particularly at the top, you lose a lot of big fish. Eh? Like I just did here, I think. Yeah, yeah. I was waiting for Paul to pull out the water, but he's too busy, I don't know what he's doing. But that's the sort of size you want to be looking for. Okay, so now we're out in about 280 metres in that area we showed you before on that drift pattern. You can see the speed on there. Get seasick looking at that. So you get seasick here. Don't be shy. You do? So with seasick, um, like, we, uh, my kids, none, none of us get seasick, but when we bring out their mates, sometimes they get seasick. So I always have um, tablets. And there's a new one out, which is a, um, it's like a, um, like normally use travel calm, right, for the, for the kids, but this is a new one. And it's really good, guys. It's not, doesn't make them sleepy and they seem to be more active all during the day and it's, and it's really good that like it works. So I'll, um, I'll put the name on, um, I'll, I'll take it to you guys. It's always a good feeling to get flame snapper. They just, they're good in the water. They're good to eat. They're good to everything. So that's like the average size. It's not a bad size actually. Probably about six kilo. And they're really nice to eat. So this might be the cod bite, not sure. So see the see the fish on there, All right? So that's the second one there just then. But see how it goes like that. So cod, when they feel, feel resistance, sometimes they'll swim up, and you think, oh, I'll just snap my line off. But it's actually this is still on there. So I always check like I did then, and they're on there. So I think there might be two on there actually. So I've dropped the speed back a little bit. You rarely get problem with um, whales and that biting your fish off out there. It's very, very rare. Mako maybe. Uh, we've had a few Makos around the boats over the years, but um, not, they have, not like you're doing closely. So this particular spot, um, which is that new spot we tried, uh, Paul on his rod, after I got this up, his rod was loaded, he got two as well. So he got four cod in one drop. They weren't really big, I think 20 kilos might have been, or 25 might have been the biggest on, on here maybe. I'm going to add to my zero set there. <laughs> it, should be, it should have kept going a bit further up. Sorry. So you can see the lights attached to the snap swivel up the top here. So this particular day, uh, now the, the wind's dropped off a bit. Um, we weren't reversing much at all. And Paul's actually got that new, the new Yamaha with the spot lock. And it's a single motor. I was very impressed 
the Howe Master. I was very impressed for a single motor to how it held us on the spot. Normally you need two motors working collectively together, but um, the one motor did really well. And that's it. Yeah, so just a quick one. So that's sort of what you should expect to see and do when you get out there, okay? Do you mind to switch that light back on? Thanks, buddy, for doing that, mate. So just quickly, um, don't need that anymore, guys. We're just about done, guys. So um, I'll just quickly show this. If you've got any questions, welcome to ask me. I'll just show you this quickly first. So um, let's just say, mate, this for the gentleman before, let's just say this is my GPS and I've got it on a, say, a four, 500 metre um, area, right? So 500 metres from there to there. And I've got a, um, I start, always put down the start of my drift there and I've got a couple of little spots here in between. Another one over here. And maybe another one there. And then my end of my drifts here. I might have one over here as well. So when I do my drift, um, let's just say the current's going south and it's running at um, 1.2 knots. And let's just say the wind is um, blowing um, from the north as well. So that 1.2 knots includes windage. So, and what we do as soon as we go, so I've got tracks on there from last time on a red one here. So I've got tracks from here where I've gone up and down and I've also got tracks here where it might have been blown a northeast from another time. That's why I say leave it on there so you know where your, where your drift is mate and know where your marks are on there. And um, sometimes the wind might be a westerly so my drift's going to be more, there's always southerly current normally, so it's going to be more that way. So sometimes I'll find a new spot out here I didn't know about it before, but that wind forced me to get out that way and I've marked a new mark on there, you know, which is always a good thing. Um, but what I'll do, the first drift I'll do, I'll never go over my grounds. I'll go, I'll pull up here, maybe a bit further up here, and I'll stop here, right? And we'll cut the bait up and we'll get everything ready, rods in, wired up, ready to roll. In that period, um, I might have drifted off the chart and I'm actually down here somewhere, if you it made it bigger. And I think, okay, it's 1.2 knots and we've drifted, you know, um, sort of one eight point over K in the last 10 minutes. So, and I know it takes about five or six minutes to get down to the bottom. So what I'll do, if I haven't got a start mark, which means the reef is actually down here somewhere, um, but that's where I'll start because it takes me that long to get to the bottom. Does that make sense? So you must do that. You must know how long it's going to take you to get there. That's why we do this blind drift first. And if that current there was running at three knots, then I'm going to start my drift up here somewhere. Because I know it's going to, I'm going to be down, down here by the time I, well, in doing that same drift as 1.2 knots, when I get my gear ready, I've, I've drifted actually 1.4 K, so. So I think, holy crap, I'm, I'm going to start up further. So I'll start right up here. And by the time I get to the bottom, I'm right on that area again. And whichever way that the, the drift has taken me is the angle that I'm going to do on that day to do my drift over the marks. So I'll go from here, I'll drift down there, I'll come back up here, go up to here, right to wherever it is, and drop our lines here and try and nail it on the first drift. Does that make sense? Um, but when you get days when the current's really running hard, um, say at three knots or, or three and a half knots, say it's November, but the fish are on the sound are stacked up and you want to have a drop and you think God's running so fast and it's a glass out, but just running real fast. Um, what you do guys is you actually drop your line around here, about here, right? And you steam up, and that's 500 meters, so you steam up um, in 250 meters deep. You steam up about 250, 300 meters up into the current on the same angle as you're doing. 
and then you stop it out that no more line out. And as you come down, you get one hit at it. As you come down, your line's uh, sort of, it sort of catches up, does that make sense? In reverse to what you would normally do. So you've gone up into the current and your line's way back in the current. You've got to hit the bottom, but it does hit the bottom eventually. So it's not very far away from where you, where you started. And the boat catches up to it. And during that period, it, 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 they bite like crazy. They really bite hard. Have you never done that before? Yeah, that's how the pros do it, eh? The drop liners and the, lo and the electric reel pushers. So learn to do that in strong current. Any over two and a half knots, you've got to learn to, you've got to, learn to do that. Okay. Um, other than that, some days you'll get it, like I said, with the big bow in your line. That's really hard. Under 400 metres you can you get away with it, but when you're fishing five or 600, it gets a bit tricky. Um, and then other days, when the wind is stronger than the, the, um, than the current, um, it goes the reverse. You're actually still drifting south, but the wind's keeping in, not doing much at all. So that those days is actually your line tends to um, escape from it a little bit. You know, it goes, keeps going out. So you've just got to actually back into the current. But the trouble is backing into a um, into the wind. Sorry, but when you back into the wind and you got a current out there, you get those waves stand up and you go water in the back of your boat. So be really careful. Know your boat, what it can handle in those pressure waves. Because you get a, white, a big roll of white water foam comes down into your boat, if it's blowing, say, 20 knots or something. Um, it's a bit scary when the back of your boat fills up with water. Had that happen a few times. Um, so, yeah, be careful. Um, apart from that, um, I think you guys are, should be up to speed. Right? Or, what about like, drops off like 80 metres? If it drops off 80 metres, yeah, good question. Um, you keep letting the line out, it's as simple as that. It back it up, back it up, back it up, and instead of go down with it, mate, it'll, it goes down quick because it's obviously a big sinker. So it hits the bottom, it'll find the bottom pretty quick. But if it keeps shelving off, um, it's once it gets to around about 600, I pull the lines up. It's you don't get many fish over 600. Yeah, and your best fishing is always in that area around 380 to 450. So Twee Canyons, I love that 380 to 480 maybe. It's rarely 520 we might go out to. Riviera Grounds and, and I'm sorry, Jim's Mountain, I'll fish up to about 520. Uh, but generally I like that, again, that 460 sort of thing on the edge. Yeah, and if you get a, sometimes you get a perfect run, it, it doesn't actually alter down, it just, you just drift along that edge at that depth. It's dropping off right next to the other side of the boat, it's probably 10 metres deeper, you know. But um, you sort of hang on that edge and their feet on that edge. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the fish move, if you've got like um, some of those areas where it's dark spotted, um, I'll just draw another little map here. And say we've got that C-map reveal going, and um, we've got a little bit of shading here, a little shading like that, and shading like that. And that might be say, um, I don't know, 350, and then here's 380. So it's 30 metre drop, and then here's 355 or 60, and then here's uh, 400, and then over here's four, so not sorry, around 380, so. So it's sort of undulating, and that might be 50 metres wide. You need to find, sometimes the fish, they move up and down along that, up in that deep water. So sometimes they might be in this area here, and other times they might be in this area here depending on the current, depending on a lot of things. But if you did a, a sounder all the way through here, you'll find the fish. So it's sometimes worth, I know they say um, sounders scare fish, but I think that depth, they don't give a shit. <laughs> just, they're hungry. So just go looking, go looking, find the fish, mark it, and then adjust your drift start and drift into it and give it a shot. Yeah. Bite times though? Bite times, yeah, really important. Um, and believe it or not, the deeper the water, I think it's more, even more particular. Um, like example, um, we went out uh, about six weeks ago. We bagged out on flamies, but till the bite time was at 2.30 or something, or 3 o'clock. Lasted about two hours. Till 2.30, we'd be out all day. We had like, I think, eight little pearlies. It was like so hard. Um, no flamies, no nothing. And then um, we, we were actually pearly fishing forever and then we went out looking for barcod, it wasn't happening, they were there, they just weren't biting. And then we said, okay, let's 
we got so AL run up to the flames, let's go up to there, we're down off, uh, inside of uh, Riviera Grounds. We went up to the Flamies, which was a 25k run north. And um, we got there about three o'clock or 10 past three, which we knew was the bite time. And I think at the first drift, we didn't get much. Might have been yeah, around 10 minutes before bite time. It's spot on, eh? And as soon as it hit that time, just same school of fish, it just rods just tum, 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 and we bagged out within an hour. Same bite times everything else, yeah. Same if it's the same bite time in close, it's the same out there. And generally, the bite time is, um, as I always say, two hours after high is your best bite time, no matter what time of day. Okay, yeah. Um, you do get an afternoon. The afternoon bite on flame is by far the best. You get a morning bite too, but afternoon bite, if you can hang out, if you don't mind traveling in the dark, trouble is the whales this time of the year. A pain at night time because you've got to keep a vigilant eye out. But um, definitely uh, th that afternoon bite between four and five is like rabid. It's, oh, they're aggressive. They really bite hard. Has anyone had that yet at all? Anyone stayed out late in the day? You don't get back to after dark, as my wife always knows. <laughs> get back about eight o'clock at night. But um, seven o'clock at night. Because it's a two hour run, two and a half hour run. And, and when it's whale time, it takes about three hours because you can't go fast. It's too dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we fished up in, up till dark, and they bite crazy, snap everything. There's bites out there. Yeah, yeah. I want to do a night trip, but the trouble is in summer the current's too hard, or it's too windy, and in winter there's too many whales. It's just like 70 k's of whale trap, whale. It's a lot of uh, whale traffic. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Imagine that being night time, mate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah, well, once we get to about, and with whale skies at night time, once you get to about 65 metres, that's when you're going to really peel the eyes open because it's you're into the highway. Yeah, yeah I think so. Have you got um, any eyes, like, uh, good things for, for like, the weather or way out there? Yeah, like, so... Obviously, Sunday go, was go, quite calm, but go, we got right out there on Sunday, she was really blowing up a fair bit too. Yeah, that's right. So... Um, just a couple of rules for fishing out in that depth or that distance from the seaway. Um, number one rule is, as I said before, we're in a bay. Okay, so any wind that's 15 knots, you know, or 10 knots at the seaway or 15 knots, and say they forecast up to 20 knots of southerly, once you get out past this line here, past Cape Byron and, and there, it's straight off Antarctica. There is nothing blocking it between Antarctica and us, that's it, right? And it picks up another 10 knots. So if it's 20, it's gonna be 30 out here from the south. And when you got current running in, in when it starts to run, um, the waves become very, it's like the seaway and the run out tide with a two meter swell. They stand up and they get pressure wave and they fall away. And I've been out there like my mate's 33 foot of Grady, I was driving and we were actually up in the flame stamper spot in about we're on the way out to the area about 230 metres, 240 metres, we're nearly there, it's like three k's to go. And um, it was blown about 20 knots suddenly, the current was about 2.8 knots or something like that. And I had this wave, and the swell's about two and a half metres, the swell picks up too. So once you get past this zone here, the swell will enhance if there's a bit of suddenly in it um, by about know, another metre or more, and then add to it the pressure wave. So, um, and we had a I was driving and um, driving like on that. Look, when you get here, we sort of keep out of that subtly and hug the coastline, and then we go straight out, and we're on the way out. And um, I was on the way out, and this wave broke. It was just supposed to be a bit of a wave, but and I still had dreams about it. But this wave was about 150 meters long of white water, two meters thick. So the whole top rolled, and it was white and I just turned like that and I was like, it's only about 30 metres in front. We're doing like 15, 18 knots. Big boat and went away. We shit ourselves and turned around and went back home. And we were so close to the mark and like it was so all that way out. But I've never seen a big wave break like, like dumping on the sandbank, you know, but in 200 something metres deep. So had, had we been there at that time, even that size boat, I think it would have filled our boat up. If you a little boat, you'd be in big trouble. But in a little boat, you shouldn't be in those conditions, you know. Um, so getting back to conditions, so 
Um, golden rule, westerly, over 10 knots or 15 knots, don't go out because, again, we got um, we got the mountain range here, Springbrook, whatever, and that wind comes over and it hits the ocean. It starts in the ocean about here, in here, but when you get out there, it's enhanced by double. So if it's blowing 15 knots on the 24s, it's blowing 30 knots of westerly out here because that's where it hits the ocean really bad. And a westerly, and the swell's always got some east in it or southeast in it. And again, when the westerly hits the easterly, it picks it up and it dumps. It's like going through the surf. And actually, when you go with the westerly, oh, this thing's not too bad, it's a bit, dark, bit rough. But as soon as you turn the nose into it, it's like, holy crap, they're breaking, you know? So, westerly over 15 knots, don't go out deep water. Um, any swell uh, over, I don't know, two metres, uh, be, be careful if there's current. So a swell over two metres and current, um, that's when they stand up and dump. So be careful of that. Um, suddenly over 15 to 20 knots, no swells, okay. It's like fishable, it's rough. And you still get fish. Um, but yeah, the, the ideal scenario is current under 1.5 knots, wind under 15 knots, swell under 1.5 metres. And no west in it. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you got all that, you, you're right. Any other questions at all? You have to get, unfortunately in life, like you know, in fishing, you need to have those bad experiences to understand the good experiences. <laughs> Sometimes scary. <laughs> but I come home every time. Sorry, Dan. Serious hasn't paid it yet. Um, yeah, so another questions at all, guys? So just to let you know, too, um, so with all the gear, guys, it's 30% off. Uh, till the next seminar, which is next week, but it's the same seminar, so it goes on and on. Um, and we will try and do, we've got a couple of deals going on electrics, if you're after one-on-one, -on -one, look at one. Um, and the price is better than online, okay? And we also sell the bigger ones as well. Um, but I'm being honest with you, if you want to go a big hard one and, and do it hardcore, they are the ultimate. But for me, um, I tend to use that, stop that size there. It's very, very good. Yeah, that's all I use, yeah. Just one question on the yeah. catch and that. Mm. Uh, was there different ways to look after your catch? Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so that's a really good question, Mark. So um, uh, for those of you who have never caught deep water fish before, you must, uh, and I, this is from experience, um, I, I, I still fill it all my fish and it's slimy as hell, the big cod are, uh, and so are the blue eye. Uh, but I fill it them and I skin them and then I cut them into portions about size of a house brick, so to speak. And I put it in big trays and I put it in the fridge and I've got a fridge outside, which my wife doesn't like it inside, so a fridge outside. <laughs> and uh, it all sits in there and I leave it for two to three days. And the fluid that comes out is incredible. So you've got it wrapped and well, there was no fluid, it's just like meat. And then the next minute, like two days later, it's like sitting in that much juice, you know, it comes out. If you get home and you've got a beautiful blue eye and you cut a big chunk and think, oh, I'm gonna cook this up tonight, it's so fresh. It would just be like rubber. It boils because it's just the fluids, uh, it just boils in itself. You can't get it to actually cook properly. And I've done that before, a long time ago, it first goes. So you've got to let it sit. And um, flame isn't that aren't as bad. Um, it seems to be that fish that's over 300 metres deep. Uh, but and, and sub 300, they're not as bad. But cod, I still let them sit for a couple of days. Flame is you could eat nearly that night. Yeah and snapper and kingies. So you get, you get snapper, kingies, flamies, um, obviously you get flamies, but you get uh, pigfish, uh, nannies, you get all that stuff up to about 300 metres, believe it or not. Yeah. But the average snappers, you don't get squire, they're all 50, 60, 70 centimetre. Yeah. What do you okay. look for when you're chasing blue eye? Like well, I'm looking blue eye, um, I'm chasing, I'm mainly fishing the canyon areas, and I'm fishing predominantly in about 420 to about 520. You've got to go deeper. Yeah, just that little bit deeper, mate, not much deeper. You get those, you guys, we don't get many down here, but you, up uh, off uh, sort of southern Maybe Morton. Cave in, in yeah. August or something, they're like, like, Oh, they're ready there now, mate. But they get, you get those ones that are more shallow. They're not the big drop down head style. I don't have the name, but they're another type of um, blue eye, and they're smaller size. They're really nice eating, though. Uh, they're in that sort of 8 to 20 kilo class where your bigger ones have got the steep head on them yep. and they uh, you definitely won't get one of those under about 15 kilo, they're 15 to 40 kilos.
37 is my biggest blue eye. Yeah. Which is a good fish. Any other questions, guys? So I hope you guys get there and enjoy it. Like, just enjoy it. Just be careful, though, because you're a long way offshore. Um, there's generally some of game fish in the area. Um, just remember, though, and two things to, take, to be alert of, and this is with our flames, now it's probably to finish the story before, but uh, um, we had it for, for ourselves for a few years, and then one of our customers, um, I didn't know it was him, but he was trolling. I saw this boat trolling, we both had fish on coming up, and you can't do much when you've got fish on unless you want to take the punt and just drive away the lines in the water and sacrifice the fish. Um, but he was about five k's away and he hit us with his um, radar. And for those of you who've got radars on your boat, know what I mean. You can actually ping a person exact lap and long, and then um, you can actually even track those person some of those boats. But um, and then you just go back there the next day and fish it yourself. Okay. So, but if for the other way around, if you're out there and you're heading along and you see guys that if they're moving, they're trolling, right? If they're not moving, they're bottom fishing. So. Check it out. But use, <laughs> but use, uh, and I always say to all our seminars, um, it, like, um, you got to have a little bit of manners, you know. Don't just go, especially at deep dropping. Don't just pull up next to someone, I'm always deep dropping 100 metres away. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I sort of maybe mark near where he is and go next time there, but uh, I wouldn't definitely not pull up next to him. Okay, so tonight. Um, first prize is about three, just over 300 bucks of stuff. And it will go to, my lovely wife will pull this out. Can you give us a go? So. It is, I'll do the names, okay? Um, number 17, which is Zach Leslie. Oh, Zach. Well done, buddy. What is good when a young guy gets it? Well done, mate. Dad's good. <laughs> you scored. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Cheers. Okay. Number two. Number two is just a bit of 200 bucks. There's about, um, no, I think around 1100 bucks tonight. Of gear or just under. We've had a few more people. Uh, it is number 20, which is, well, it's all mixed up here. Um, Don. Rain. Yeah, well done, buddy. Thanks, Donny. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Get there and use it. Cheers, mate. Third prize is over 150 bucks. Thanks, Donny. Um, this is one of the confusing ones. <laughs> um, it is Harry. Number six. That's you, mate. Well done. I was looking at that side, I think that was number six. <laughs> Were you guys at the back there? Cheers, mate. Oh, sorry. Oh, you better have that one, mate. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. Thanks, mate. And the next one's still over 100 bucks worth. Guys, thanks for coming along. Um, we are open for about another half an hour or so. You're welcome to have a look at something there if you want, or you can come back. Number 19, which is going to be close down to Zach. Yeah. Luke Jenkins. Well done, Luke. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Thank you mate. Well done. Okay, dig deep. Uh, okay. Lucky 11, they say. Steve, that's you, buddy. Well done, Steve. Oh. Um, that's fit, that's right, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Steve. Thank Cheers, mate. Okay, number six. So we normally do six, but we did eight today. Right down the back there somewhere, number 23, which is Kim, is it? Yeah, yeah well done, Kim. Getting down towards the bottom, mate, but that's a little bit something there. <laughs> well done, mate, nice to meet you too. Cheers, mate. Please keep. Thank you. Oh, I might be the lucky one. Um, okay. Number another one down the back. Twenty-two. <laughs> Which is Shane. Yeah. Oh, well done, Shane. 
Maybe the Brisbane boys are cleaning up on the bottom end, but <laughs> good on you, matey. Thanks, Shane. And last one. This is a conspiracy, this is. Number 20. Sorry for the guys at the front. 28. So we squeezed in a few more guys this time. Somewhere on there. Oh. John Jones. Yeah, right here, right here. Oh, there you are. Oh, John. <laughs> That's right, you were down the bad chair, were you, number 28? <laughs> Good on you, Johnny. <laughs> Sorry, mate. So, guys, thanks for coming along. Um, we've got the stuff downstairs. We're going to have a look. You're welcome to have a look. If not, please be careful driving home. And please be careful out in the ocean. This weekend looks for this sort of fishing, I don't know. Um, I would have loved to go on today.